call the meeting to order. Uh, first on the agenda is public comment. This is comment on anything that's not currently on the agenda. Sally? Yes. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd like to give you a brief report from the library, if that's okay. Um, the summer reading program, which I think we've told you about before, has been an absolutely tremendous success. Courtney and Kate put together weekly bundles that are age appropriate. They give the kids a free book. They give them craft projects. They give them all kinds of extra stuff. And they put together, I think it's a, it's a six week, maybe an eight week program. I'm sorry, I don't know that. But they give them the kids two weeks at a time. 170 youngsters have signed up. That's twice what we had last year for the reading program. So I guess that tells you we're doing something right there. Amy had a mom call recently to say that she was so happy that the kids were continuing to read over the summer and keeping up their reading skills. And they're so excited about the new books. And then they get to keep these books, which is really nice. So they're building a little bit of a library. The downstairs bathroom has an ADA reno, which should start the week of August 24th. The contractor thinks it'll take two to three weeks and there will be disruption, unfortunately, but the library will still be open as much as it is now, which is, I think you can go in on Monday and Thursday and you can make an appointment to be there to use a computer and it's limited, but still we have people, <clears throat> excuse me, people able to go in. We just hired a new IT consultant after parting ways with the town's contractor. That is Josh Trudeau from Gifford. I don't know the man, I have not met him, but I understand that he knows an awful lot about networking, which is what the library really needs. And the book discussions, um, as in a book group, um, be, the library and Bethany Church and four jointly have been sponsoring a series of books, a series of discussions dealing with books on racism. And there was a discussion about a week, week and a half ago on Just Mercy. I think there was two, two days, one evening followed by one morning. And I think that all together there were in the 20s in terms of how many people came. The next one is How to Be an Anti-Racist and that will be Tuesday, September 9th at seven and Wednesday, the, I'm sorry, September 1st at seven and Wednesday the second at 10 in the morning. And if any of you are interested in that, you can get the book or find out about um, joining the discussion either through Kimball or through Bethany Church. We have, um, I think we've also told you before, we have a, a new kind of an informal thing, a book chat. There's no preparation required, although preferred that you choose a book and read it, but we choose different um, genres or, to or general topics. And the book um, subject for this coming month is traveler, travel memoirs. Um, so that will be interesting. I'm quite enjoying the book that I'm reading and it's so informal and just easy and laid back and fun. So things are still moving along. Um, we're chugging and, and all the staffs is, staff is excited and interested in everything that's going on. We're doing good things. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Who's doing the bathroom renovation? I'm sorry, Pat, I don't know that. I, I did, but I don't have the paperwork in front of me. Okay, thanks. If you'd like me to find out and tell you, I'd be happy to. It's not a big deal, but I'd just be interested. Okay. Great. Any other questions for Sally? Okay. Thanks, Sally. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'm going to move on to approval of the agenda. We have a few amendments to it. Yes. If I may ask the select board to uh, entertain adding three items to the agenda. The first uh, two items are both under old business. Uh, the first item would be Norwich Solar. Uh, the second item would be appointments to discuss appointments to the East Valley Community Group and Fire 
operations review committee. And the third item would be an executive session uh, under 3133 to discuss um, uh, current employees of the town, current appointed employees of the town. Any motion to approve the agenda with the amendments? So moved. I'll second that. And then the second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you. Next is the consent calendar. This is meeting minutes and warrants. Uh, we have meeting minutes for July 9th and July 16th. Uh, Larry pointed out in a recent email about uh, meeting minutes for, uh, Larry, I believe it was for June 26th. The 24th, I believe. Yeah. So adding the minutes of the 24th and the warrants, uh, any motion to approve those? I'd like to um, point out an error in the in the in the uh, minutes from six twenty four. Um, on page three, where it talks about the vote for the for the motion for the resolu the racism resolution. On the bottom of page three. It says that Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Satkowitz abstained, but I believe that should be Mr. Armstrong and Mrs. Broussard. I voted for that. Okay, I will work on our end to make the correction if everyone agrees with that. Any other changes? Not for me, that was it. Okay, motion to approve with the changes to the minutes of the 24th. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. New business. First up is the review of the bids for custodial services. Uh, in your packet, you will find a, an action item sheet that includes the one bid that we received uh, for custodial services. Um, just a, as a reminder to the board, the bid was advertised in the Herald, was posted uh, in a statewide um, bid posting site as well as posted on the town's website. Um, we received uh, the loan bid from our existing uh, service provider and um, we recommend uh, that the board accept the bid. You said it was up from last year. How much was it up, Adolfo? Uh, it is up slightly. I don't have the, the amount from the previous contract. The addition is mostly due to a waxing and stripping of the tile flooring in the, in the clerk's office. That was something that had been left off of the existing contract uh, and the clerk's office wanted to include that back into the contract just to make sure that that area remained clean. Um, I, I'd have to take a look at the current contract but I don't believe it's it's more than four thousand dollars from the previous contract. Other questions on it? Any motions? If we approve the cleaning bid from Burbax Cleaning. I will second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Stain or nays? Stain, all good. 
Streetlight petition for Lincoln Avenue. We received uh, a communication from Mr. Nicholas Pappas who lives on Lincoln Avenue. Mm -hmm. He had indicated that the light in front of his home was very bright. And um, he had also had indicated that several of his neighbors felt the same way. Um, rather than just take one resident at their word, what I suggested to Mr. Pappas was that if it was urgent and that he felt very strongly and a way for me to confirm that his neighbors felt the same way is to ask him to complete a, a petition that included the purpose for the petition and that it includes signatures from his neighbors. Uh, Mr. Pappas did that, uh, collected signatures from the neighbors that surround the area covered by the street light and submitted it to the town for, for review. Uh, Green Mountain Power has said that they are willing to remove the light because the existing light is the least powerful light that they have in their um, in their arsenal. Uh, and they're, so they're willing to remove it. They just need the town to tell them to remove it. Is there any penalty if they take the light out? Is it a longer term contract or anything? No, there's no penalty. Uh, they, they would just remove the light as as a request, uh, as a way to fulfill the request from the town. They wouldn't charge us for it. It would be done free of charge. But we don't have a like a three year contract or anything with them. So the cost of it would be removed too. That's right. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't increase any, any existing contracts that we have with Green Mountain Power would not be affected. Delfo, in the diagram that we have, the, the red dots, are, all, are, are those all the homeowners who have signed the petition? Uh, yes, all of the dots. Uh, let me just take another quick look here. Uh, the street, all of the red dots are the residents that have signed the petition, and the yellow dot is where the street light is located. Okay. Sounds reasonable to me. Yeah. This is in my immediate neighborhood, and um, I've made that loop in the evening hours, not in response to any requests, but just because that's where I walk my dogs every night, uh, or most nights, and um, that light is quite bright, so um, uh, in reflecting on it, pardon the pun, <laughs> uh, um, so I'm, I'm comfortable with this, and I also recognize the names of most of the signatories here and trust their judgment, so. Are there other lights around that common area? So there is still some light? Um, yes, I believe there are. Or yes, there are, <laughs> I should say. Um, I, can't, I can't say for sure how many, but um, the area is well illuminated. Thanks. Other questions? Comments? Motions? Um, I will move that we approve the removal of the street light as requested by the um, petition signatories and ask uh, the, the, the electric company to do so. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Stain. Motion carries. Logo for Randolph Conservation Commission. Uh, the Randolph Conservation Commission has created two logos that they would like to use. Um, one logo would be used in publications and another logo would be used for, um, you know, if they were to commission signs or just um, for items that were other than letterhead. Um, they have asked the select board to consider the logos and uh, hey there, approve um, the use. Are really moving through this agenda. In your action item sheet, you would have uh, pictures of the logos, uh, the color logo, and then also the non-color logo would be used by the Conservation Commission. So just a policy question, Adolfo. Um, 
are we getting to where we have way like different logos for every group in Randolph? You know, we have the the welcome signs that are in coming into the village and coming into Randolph Center are like we just approved a completely different one for East Randolph. We have a town logo, and now we have a independent committee asking to have their own logo. Uh, that is, that could be a challenge. We don't have a, I would say a, um, a color scheme or a process or a policy in place that says committees and groups have to follow a certain sign scheme. Um, it could create one, but I think the, the, the Conservation Commission would potentially point to the sign in East Randolph that is very different from the current ones and and maybe ask why theirs may is not or may not be uh, approved. But we well, could create I think that. They're different though. One's, one's coming into a physical location in town announcing the town, but now we have a separate committee of the town looking for its own logo. So are we gonna approve a different one for the development review board for the planning commission for the fire services committee you know what i mean like how many different logos do we want to have out there representing the town of randolph mm -hmm. and i guess a question for josh where do we get where do we get this to a point where it's a like an identity crisis you know what i mean like shouldn't we have some common branding or theme to what we're doing? Uh, yes, I mean, um, I, I think having too many logos definitely does. Um, it, it, uh, it, it, it does not, we should have a common theme. Um, every committee should not have their own logo. Um, we should have a color, at least a common color scheme, font, um, that that would be ideal. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the the fact that a lot of different bodies of the town doing work feel like um, they want to represent themselves in a way um, that is different from the the towns. Um, I guess says something. Um, I guess it says that they, they the the town's logo might not be a calling to them. Um, but it also shows some some real initiative uh, to represent their community. So I see some positive in that. But mm -hmm. I, I, I do agree. I think I think there should be some uh, some central colorways and fonts that we should be utilizing as a town in all of its committees and boards. Yeah. yeah. I, as, as somebody with um you know, basically 40 years of experience in marketing communications and publications and logo development. Um, I fully agree with Josh, um, at least some general consistency and guidelines in terms of logo usage, I mean, of uh, font usage and placement, color scheme, and then um, giving some leeway to each individual committee or town entity to uh, adopt uh, that, agreed upon look to its own logo is, is one thing, but having every other committee willy nilly designing its own logo is just inconsistent with good branding and, and, and uh, of the town and identifying of the town, so. If I may, I'd like to add that um, the Conservation Commission did reach out in advance of creating a logo to ask if we had um, some kind of a plan or a book or something that would guide them in creating the plan. And my response to them was, no, we don't have a formal process yet to guide creating of, of logos, so. Yeah, I agree we don't have anything yet, Adolfo. My concern is that, you know, this logo, um, while it says the word Randolph, it doesn't identify whether it's Randolph Mass or some other state. You know, mm -hmm. it, I, what we really want to do is make sure that we have a way of tying all these together as being part of Randolph, the town. Sure. Right. Yep. So it's not a group out there 
on its own. It's a group that's appointed by the select board. So it's a town committee. And how do we, you know, we could say we like this and everybody else has to follow that pattern, right? Or, um, but I just wanted to make sure we were putting some thought into this that we don't end up with all these different <clears throat> ways of identifying each group. Yeah. Uh, I think it's particularly important as I read the background to this, where it says that they would like to use this on town forest kiosks and in correspondence promotions and publications. To me, that argues even more for a consistent look. If we're going to have this logo up throughout our town forests and conservation trails and conservation sites. It just feels like it should be consistent with an integrated look for the whole town. If it's helpful, I can reach out to the uh, Conservation Commission. I could potentially attend their next meeting and say it wasn't it, the board. If the action is to table the this particular issue, I could let them know that it wasn't for dislike of the logo. It was more an interest of having a common theme throughout the town for all the committees uh, and ask for their help in creating a process that can guide creating logos for other committees. Well, and to have it somehow so that there's features of it, whether it's, you know, I think font is good and whatever, but I think there's also needs to be some type of a feature that's in all the logos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah something that ties it all so everybody's like oh that's random you know and it doesn't have to be you know they don't have to all have just the morgan horse in the middle of them they can change the name of their committee type thing that's not what i'm thinking i'm thinking there just needs to be some feature that helps tie it to the rest of them i think i think there's some opportunity to have that conversation at least in terms of the economic development council yes. and the work with um uh, Randolph and Motion marketing piece. Um, we are starting those conversations for another um, issue and uh, website. And so naturally we wanna develop um, something that can be used um, across town uh, materials. And so we will be talking about colorways and fonts and maybe as we discuss that, we can incorporate what all the other town bodies are doing to see how we can uh, work together in creating something that resonates with everybody. Mm -hmm. So is there somebody on the Arts Council that might want to work with you guys on that? Um, I, I would, uh, w without, without putting this out for, you know, a public bid or anything like that, I, I would like to say that Valerie Schoolcraft's work on the marketing piece that just came out uh, Randolph in Motion it, it is, is extraordinary. She is clearly um, skilled in creating a graphic identity for a piece like that. And um, I don't know that someone on the Arts Council would need to weigh in on it if we have that level of talent in the community that could help us develop this. Well, the only problem with that is, is Valerie's position at her job has increased her demand for her time. So I don't think we're gonna be able to utilize Valerie as much going forward. So I don't think she's available to, we can ask her, but she implied yeah. to us that she was, she's tied up. Uh, th there's no one on the arts and culture committee right now that is a graphic designer or or logo developer per se. There's a, rich, uh, a richness of different artistic um, uh, capabilities there, but this is really a graphic design um, issue. Uh, so whether we go out and, and seek other, um, other counsel on this or not might be um, you know, something we wanna discuss. Uh, Logo development is a really specialized talent. Um, and, and, and then establishing what's called an identity kit where you say, okay, each individual committee can adapt the logo in this way. Um, that's, that's all a pretty specialized skill set. Um, and I think it merits us to look into it, but um, 
I'm not sure that the Arts and Culture Committee is the is the place for that. It's more of an economic development issue in some respects. All right, any other comments on that? Perry, if you're trying to come through, you gotta unmute. Sorry. So I agree with Tom. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, maybe that we need to look at the Economic Development Committee and Josh can maybe run that by them the next meeting and we can further the conversation. But I know what you're talking about because I had to go through that process myself and yeah. it is time consuming. Yeah. So. I think we'll be happy to take that on. Great. And Josh, if 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 um, if Valerie is not able to take this on, um, uh, based on years of experience working with graphic designers in in a variety of nonprofit settings, I might be able to steer the Economic Development Committee towards some other um, graphic artists that might be able to assist with this. Great, thanks. That would be very helpful. Yeah. Adolfo, what we need to make sure we message back to them, though, is that we applaud the initiative mm -hmm. of them creating this and that it is actually kind of a neat design for what their committee does. It is, yeah. Um, the only concern is that we end up with 30 different logos for the town of Randolph. Yep. Yeah, I'll plan to attend their next meeting and I'll... I'll, I'll... I'll reassure them that it wasn't their design. It was, it's just that the town is lacking what it needs to have now that we have more activity in all of our committees and commissions. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll share that with them. Great, thank you. Sure. Main Street Guy Cables. We um, have had a restart of the conversation of the existing Guy Cables over Main Street. Um, the conversation was restarted by uh, Raman, uh, the group that is formed to help provide social service or to relay information of social service social services that are available to residents in our region. Um, they were hoping to place a banner informing residents of services that are available in our region as a way to further promote what's available uh, for help. Uh, and so that started the conversation. Um, we have uh, RACDC, we have Julie uh, here in the meeting who agreed to speak on behalf of the request to have a, the cables brought back into service. Julie, you're, uh, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I didn't know if I could unmute myself or not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, I don't know um, how much I need to say about it. We um, the first step was that the the um, banner uh, guy uh, that was attached to Redline and was repaired because for many years it was um, it was down because of a previous repair that was not done correctly. So that's been fixed, and so now it is possible to have a banner across Main Street. And um, and so Raman would like to do that, and we're the fiduciary for Raman. So um, so we offered to to initiate the request. Uh, I understand there are other issues around sign ordinances and things that are coming up that um, that uh, we've been you know learning about from Adolfo and are um, hoping to be able to find a way to carry on this tradition. Um, but for the time being, uh, I understand that. It's under the old ordinance. And so we'd like to make this request now with the understanding that if there's um, you know, any way that we can help and be involved going forward in making sure that the banner can be used in the future, we'd like to do that. Um, so that's, and if anyone has any questions. So um, in my time, I thought there was uh, multiple times that that banner has failed. Uh, and the last time we took it down, when we took it down, it was when Mel was the town manager and there was a discussion about changing it off those buildings and moving it to some posts 
down by the Main Street Bridge to uh, get it off of the, to get the liability of damage to the buildings removed. And I don't know where the research on that as an option ever went, if at all forward, but. Um, if, hmm. That's the first, that's the first time I've ever heard of um, that discussion. And if you're talking about the posts that exist currently on the bridge, I'm not sure they're high enough in the yeah. air. It was to set new posts. There's, oh, okay. there's a conversation with the power company about cleaning up all those lines there. And it, it dovetailed into that discussion. You know, if you look at that bridge, you got power going down both sides or utilities going down both sides because one is managed by the power, Green Mountain Power. The other one's managed, I believe, by the, what used to be New England Telephone. So I don't know who owns them now, but, uh, and they refuse to work with each other because nobody wants to pay a fee to the other guy to be on their poles. And that's why there's utilities down both sides. Okay. So there was a uh, discussion and this all was in the round when the fire station stuff was going on. We had it again about the utilities, about forcing them onto one side and then it would clean up that whole mess right there at the end of the bridge on the downtown side of it, not on the fire station side of it, on the southern side. Mm -hmm. And then you would set two new poles that could be nicer poles to put the banner off of there. The idea being then the infrastructure would belong to the town and would greet people as they came into town and whatnot. I just, there was a whole conversation about it. And I believe at the time that we decided we were not going to put the guy wires back up, there was a discussion about that the town, if the guy wires went back up in the current location, that the town wanted no liability of it. And that was something that the owner of the Northfield Savings Bank was not willing to do. Um, so there, there's two things to my mind, and I've had quite a few discussions um, in the course of this process because I'm involved with Raman, uh, with both Julie and Adolfo, and there's sort of two different tracks happening here. One is that Raman and RACDC are putting in this request under the old sign ordinance, which is still in existence because we're still pondering the new one. And the second issue is that is just that, that any further discussion of where a banner might go or who might be responsible for it or who might be responsible for ensuring it and what its content might be is really relevant to the new sign ordinance, not to the existing one. So this is essentially a one-time request in the here and now under the old sign ordinance for Raman to be able to post a COVID-19 pandemic related banner for a time to be determined under the old sign ordinance with the understanding that RICDC has strengthened and put uh, environmentally, I'm sorry, engineering related, engineering wise sound anchors into their side of, um, of Main Street of the, uh, of the Red Lion building. And so we're, we're really dealing with a one-time request here. Uh, and these other issues can be mitigated or, or resolved as we move forward with the sign ordinance, um, which by the way, is on our agenda this evening. So if I could, Trini, I, this is the first time that we have ever heard about that. We understood that the reason that the banner wasn't being used anymore was because the anchor in red line and came down and we wouldn't have put it back up if we thought it wouldn't be used. Um, but there are a couple of things that we probably should do if we want to continue to use it. One is you know, sort of what you were talking about with the logos is that there need to be specs for the banner because it's my understanding from talking with Bob Wright that the reason that the last one came down was because 
it wasn't perforated sufficiently. And so it created too much of a, a sail, which, you know, exacerbated the, the problem with the previous repair. So I think there's ways to do it safely. And what I'd recommend too, what I would ask is that the certificate of insurance that the town gets from whoever puts the banner up covers the building owners too. And that way, if anything happens, everybody's covered. Well, I, I think the challenge, what, one of the challenges to overcome is, is the installation part of it. Um, you know, I think traditionally the Randolph Center Fire Department had been asked to put the banner up, but if, if a banner is being put up by the town, then is the implication that the town would have to ensure the banner and the buildings if, if something were to happen or is the requesting agency um, going to ensure the banner placement and ensure any incident that were to happen if the cables were to come off? Well, I think the way your current, uh, your current language reads, it's installation. They're, in, they're ensuring the installation and the, it being up as well and the taking down. So you would ask for the same coverage certificate. No, I understand that, but I, I think that if, but if the, if the Randolph Center Fire Department is doing it, then our group's going to then say, well, the town put the banner up, so we're not responsible if the banner were to cause damage. Well, we can just not have the town install the banner. Yeah. Yeah, but it becomes, I think, financially unfeasible if the town can't do that because you'd have to hire a bucket truck or something. I don't know. It seems like that's something you could get over if, you know, because it would be with the understanding that the town is going to be doing this and that that's part of what you're, you know, you, you're waiving liability for that, but they know how to do it. They've done it for years. So as long as they don't fix the buildings, I think that they can certainly hang it up. That, that would be my take at least. I don't think there's ever been a problem with them hanging them. So it seems like the thing to do then is to start off with asking the Randolph Center Fire Department again, if they're willing to hang the banners. I don't know who the liability falls on. Um, I think going a little further back in what Trina was talking about, the concept of having these on two poles would, would eliminate having the need for the fire department to actually emplace them because if you did this correctly, it wouldn't take but maybe three or four people to put the banner up from the ground similar to a flagpole. So going forward, that's another discussion, but that was another thought about having the poles at the other end of the, down by the bridge. Do, mm -hmm. do, do you mean that they would be the banners would be raised similar to the way we raise a flag? Yeah, I think with that's a right. police system with a police system or something like that on each pole. Absolutely, and then you don't need to involve the fire department at any point in time to hang a banner. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's how it's done in a lot of places. These banners are on two opposing poles, and you just have a team of people. You know, whatever it takes four people maybe to you have to stop traffic, obviously. So you need a little bit of traffic control here. And then, you know, two people literally should be able to pull them up a flagpole. You could possibly do that same thing with the buildings too. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you might be able to do it. You just got to make sure that you secure that so that obviously, you know, whoever's, you can't let somebody come along and untie the ropes. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. That would be, a, that's a concern in both locations. No, seriously, absolutely. It's a, that's a vandalism thing that could happen. So you have to be thinking about that, but possibly, yeah, maybe it's a pulley system that's, that's used and then removed or something. I don't know, with a little bit of engineering time, I think you could probably work it out and it could probably work in both locations. Or it's got a locking mechanism on it or something like Some, that. Something that, yeah, but, maybe, it's, maybe but, it's a steel cable with a, with a lock or something, right, exactly. But again, we're, we're sort of moving into a longer term discussion here. Yes. And that's what so <laughs> the question is for the immediate future under the existing sign ordinance, 
And given the, the Raman's efforts to really respond to the pandemic and educate people in the town about issues surrounding that, do we want to grant a one-time, for now, one-time only permission for Raman to consider under RACDC's fiduciary uh, control, putting up a banner on the existing cabling? Um, the, the longer term discussion is clearly fraught with a lot of um, legal issues and bureaucracy and uh, all of that, but the, the present discussion is just about this one-time request. Correct. Tom, the problem is that the documents that came with our packet are not talking about a one-time request. This agreement that's been drafted by our ACDC for everybody to sign talks about issuing permits, using a banner permission form, substantially like the one attached. Right, right. You know, uh, town will issue permits to applicants for use. It's not about what is the agreement between the town and Raman for this one-time event. That's what we need an agreement on. And the other concern I have is that we don't have anything that says the Northfield Savings Bank side is ready for this to be hooked in because their side gave out once too. Um, based on the discussions that I've had with Julie and with Adolfo over uh, the days running up to, to, to this meeting. Um, and Julie, you can, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the letter that Julie submitted dated August 11th, which is also part of our packet today, in, in, in many respects supersedes the MOU um, and, and, and draft permission form that uh, we submitted several days ago, um, because as this discussion has evolved, it became more about this one-time uh, ramen banner being erected on the existing cabling. And um, with the understanding, at least I thought between Adolfo and Julie and myself that um, further discussion of the banner program in the context of the, of the new sign ordinance would come at a later date. That's right. I was asked additionally to draft an MOU for use of the, the cables. And then um, after that, it was you know clear that the planning commission was revisiting the ordinance for various reasons. And that and then Adolfo raised the, the question of just requesting this one immediate banner be allowed to be put up. I do, I do um, should add that some of the conversations that we did have over the week, I included a request for me to, to, to find out if the Northfield connections were sec are secure, as secure as, as um, Julie, as you mentioned, the connections are on the Red Lion Inn building. Um, and one of my uh, continued points was the, the portion of insurance where, where I, didn't, I didn't feel comfortable recommending to the board that it approve this with the town taking on the liability. Um, but it would be a different situation if a, a either Northfield or RACDC would agree to take on the liability. Um, and then it would be more of a, a partnership as opposed to the town incurring all liability and then also putting up the banner. But the town- When, when you say the town incurring liability, I'm sorry, when, when you say the town incurring liability, are, do you mean that our insurance company would be required to, to pay in case of some sort of an accident? Yeah. Yes. If the, okay, if so the, can I say that yeah. that's okay? Like it's unlikely to happen and that's what insurance is for. That's what we pay for. Um, and I don't think we should let this get in the way of putting up this banner. I, I, I would like to add Larry that we don't have, our insurance isn't necessarily like a traditional insurance where we are we, we, do, we do pay and are insured in the way that a traditional insurance is, uh, is, is 
kind of out there, but we're a part of a group. And if our insurance company, and they've done this before, I think it was the year that I came to Randolph, they asked the member town to leave. They expelled the member town from passive because that group was not following the procedures that passive was been, was asking them to follow. They were putting themselves in, in a place where they were becoming a, a liability to passive. So passive can, if, if the board approves this and if the board accepts all the liability and the falling of the cables causes, you know, it's, you know, I'm hoping it doesn't happen, but there is a chance that they fall and could potentially hurt someone seriously. Passive can kick us out of passive. Yeah, Adolfo, I think we actually had to have that listed separate in the insurance policy mm -hmm. for the town of Randolph and it was removed when, when we quit having the banner up there. Mm -hmm. And it was on two fronts. We had to have, uh, there was coverage for damage to the buildings, but also liability for the cables if they were to come down onto anything underneath them. So, so Trini, where would, if, if looking toward the future, if we were to erect poles somewhere along the bridge at either end or in the middle or whatever, wherever they might be, where would the liability for those, you know, the erection of those banners be, where would it fall? And, and secondly, under, under whatever evolves as the new sound, uh, sign ordinance, um, who would determine the content of those banners? Uh, this, is a, this is a constitutional issue that's been litigated by the Supreme Court at this point in terms of um, purview over content. So we're really, you know, this is a complex, is a much yeah. more complex issue than, the than issue just over con the issue over content. I'm not even going to wade into the issue well, over liability and whatnot. If we owned the poles, which we don't own the building, and we managed who was allowed access and whatnot, then that liability falls on the town, and we would we should be making sure that that's listed when we list all our different facilities. That becomes a facility. And then when we list our risks on the liability side, it gets listed there. What we had before was we didn't list, it wasn't a facility, it was under, um, I forget the categories, but it's like leased property. And then we had it under general liability risk. So if we owned the polls, and we controlled who had access to them, not, I don't care what the content is, but who could put a sign up and all that, then that liability, we would need to insure for it. My concern right now is I don't think we're insured for anything. And, you know, yeah, it's uh, maybe it's low risk, but, you know, it's happened before. The wire pulled out with the bricks attached to it and it came down. There was some damage, um, but we had it listed. If it's not listed, Passive isn't going to pay for it. It, it. If it was listed before, I'm curious why the repair wasn't made. <laughs> I, I can I can add to, to Trini's point. Uh, about two years ago, there, we had a period of high winds. Um, when the winds knocked down several trees, one of those trees destroyed the chain link fence that surrounded um, one of our uh, reservoirs, one of our water facilities. When we went to submit to Passive a claim to repair the fence, which was roughly about $1,200, Passive said that the fence to them is considered something called property in the open. And because we had not reported the fence in our insurance claim, they denied the claim. Um, so if, if we were to do something, the effect of voting to, or the board was going to vote to put up a banner on wires that are currently not listed on our insurance policy uh, or our, our coverage, passive could, can say the town is not covered. 
which they have done in the last two years while I've been here. We do have an option of, um, while I've been with the town, banners have only been put up on the gazebo. Uh, I know that uh, Frankenberg has put up uh, banners there, not for Frankenberg Agency, but for a walkathon and other banners have been put up at the gazebo. Uh, that, that, that could be an option while the sign ordinance and the conversation is ongoing for advertising banners. It's equally as visible and um, you know, it, it doesn't span Main Street, but it is in an equally visible location in the village. Adelfo, could we ask the insurance company if it would be covered or how much it would cost to cover it? I could ask them. I don't think they, I, you know, I, yes, Pat, I, I could certainly ask them. I don't believe that they can make changes um, mid-year because we have to submit everything uh, in December for coverage to start in January. So they cover everything on a calendar year. Um, I can ask them, sure. They, they can't add a rider to the policy in mid-year that extends additional coverage? I, I don't know that. I, I would have to ask them. Um, I, I haven't had to encounter this while I've been here, and I, I don't want to tell the board, yes, they can do it. Sure. Um, so, yeah. But, but yeah. yes, I could call to ask. Wow. Okay. So let's assume that we can get coverage and Northfield Savings Bank comes back and says, yep, our building is solid, no issues. Um, then we follow the old banner form for this one. Is that correct? We, we, we can, yes. Right. So if we're following the old process because the new sign ordinance isn't in place, for this, then I would assume we would follow the process that we had in place for banners. And so reading the form, um, we allow, um, would we have to issue some type of uh, waiver or something? Or are you looking for this to be in play not more than 22 days? No, Tom said, um, uh, so put it up at a certain day with no removal date. Right. We either um, have to a waiver for the 15 day prior, seven days after, because these are usually events, not right, right. Public messages like this. Um, well, this is certainly an event we're dealing with. Unfortunately, it's one with um, <laughs> no discernible end. <laughs> at present um you lose the effectiveness of the banner if it's been up there eight months right yeah well yes yeah it, it except would except that we have no idea how long um the need for ramen to respond or for the country and the world to respond to COVID 19 is going to go on it's not it's not a fixed event like uh, the Festival of Lights or the Illuminated Forest or Winterfest. It's um, a pandemic. I mean, but but to your question, Trini, I, I I think this has always been seasonal. I don't think anybody would want it up there in the dead of winter because that would I think increase everybody's concerns. Um, so, but I could see it being up for the rest of the fall to a certain end date, whatever that is you know, what, whatever seems like a reasonable sort of seasonal end date. So there's an end date because it has to be, if we open it up for use, it has to be open to everybody. So let's assume you put your banner up and somebody puts in an application to put another banner up in 21 days. Mm -hmm. What do we tell them? You know, if we look at our form, you get 22 days, 15 days prior and seven days after. And it's generally a one to three day event that we've allowed on there. Right. So do we tell somebody else they can't have access to it or do they have a well, 
know, do they feel like your well, your message is out there? You've had it out there for three weeks. It's our turn. Isn't it in our purview to amend the 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 um, form to say that? because this is of the unique circumstances of this, that we are giving ramen permission to extend its posting of the banner until, I don't know, October 31st or something like that, depending on when they when we finally get it up there. I mean, the, the permission form is a creation of, um, you know, a former select board and, a, and, 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 a, and the former and still existing sign ordinance. So don't we have the capacity to amend that in these circumstances? These are really unusual circumstances. This isn't, um, you know, this isn't the New World Festival or the Festival of Lights. This is a, a group that is trying to respond to an emergency that is impacting our town and it's it, you know it's not winter fast it's it's a pandemic <laughs> and this is an organization that is providing the people of our community with critical resources to weather that pandemic so i i i just feel like we're uh, i understand that we need to to uh, be cognizant of liability issues I fully understand that, um, but I'm just concerned that we're um, getting into the weeds here and letting bureaucracy um, uh, supersede public, um, the public good. That's my take on it. Bureaucracy, I think it's looking at, the, the banner goes up, how long is it up for? What is the reasonable amount of time that that message should be the one posted over Main Street. I've suggested that October 31st might be a reasonable amount of time. One never knows when winter is going to arrive here, but I agree with Julie that um, having it up there through the winter months um, doesn't necessarily make sense, but you know, we don't know, no one knows when this issue is going to end and what, when the need for what ramen is trying to offer the community is going to abate. So my suggestion would be that we, that we consider giving permission for this to go up on the existing guy wires until late fall, a date that we want to set. Um, and that would preclude any other organization from jumping in and saying, hey, you know, we want to be up there for our hour, two weeks to promote our event. First of all, <laughs> there aren't very many events happening that anybody would want to promote. Chandler is basically, with the exception of a, a, an outdoor concert uh, at Fars Hill in the coming days. I mean, there's no Chandler season. Uh, we don't know. We canceled the 4th of July parade. We don't know what the Festival of Lights might look like. This is all such a speculative time that I, I feel like we need to put aside those kinds of event-specific considerations in this instance, and let's just get it done. Tom and Julie, I have a question. I, I don't think I know of what the content of, a, of, of the Raman sign would be. We, not, not because we, I, I'm looking to police it, but just because we're, we're uh, the conversation from the board has turned to uh, events and promoting for something. It, it could be germane to what Raman is considering putting on the sign, something like you know a food donation event happening three weeks from now. Uh, I, I don't know what the discussions we've had, um, and I'm part of the communications team for Raman, as is uh, Tim Caulfield from Brookfield. Um, the discussions we've had uh, with uh, Linda Anderson uh, and uh, others on the uh, ramen team is that it would be a very generic message. It, it, it's not going to be fraught with a lot of words. It's basically going to be 
something like COVID-19 response, ramen, whatever the website address is, .org. I mean, you know, and anybody with any marketing sense knows that any more than five or six words in a web address on a banner, which is essentially a billboard, um, you know, the comment is going to be, the content is going to be very generic and it is not going to be event specific. It's going to be, for lack of a better word, response specific in terms of what Raman is trying to do for the community during these times. Okay, how about this? So how about we find a way to issue a permit for a period of time, and then if we think we need more time, you simply reapply and we can grant another round of time. Maybe initially it's eight weeks and then come back for an extension. Would that solve the problem? I think that, I think, that would be absolutely fine. Julie, how do you feel about it? I think if we were to grant a permit for a banner to be, because we still have to create this banner, we still have to determine the content. If we were to, to uh, move to grant a permit for a banner to go up until October 31st, I would be perfectly comfortable with that. Um, that sounds fine to me. I mean, yeah. I, and, the, and just, just FYI, the purpose of the MOU initially was to just actually initiate some clarifying discussion like this because it always has been a bit of a mystery to us how the whole banner thing works um, as sort of a representative of the building owner too. So I think this is good discussion to have to make sure that everybody knows exactly where they stand and how long you know the season is and things like that. So for this one, absolutely, I think that works perfectly and um, and we'd love to, you know, to be able to have more discussion about it so that we can nail those other questions down for you. So it seems realistically to me, you guys have you got to get permission. To, you know, you get the permission to do the banner. You got to create the banner. You got to get the banner. You know, or you got to create what the logo is going to look like or what your content is going to look like, and then you got to get it produced. So theoretically, it might take two weeks to get there, right? Right. So if on yeah. September 1st, you launch the banner and you go for eight weeks, theoretically, you'd be near the end of October. Right. So right. I, I think that's a reasonable, you know, a, a reasonable solution to this situation currently. Great. I think it is too, Perry, um, but it needs to be contingent upon us getting coverage through passive. Yes, I think that's all, yeah, what, what we talked about before, yes, you need to make sure that that's all part of the equation here. And I think we've got to have a different uh, form for them to sign because we're, we're not following the old form and we're not ready for the MOU that was drafted. Far from it, no, no. So it needs to be some other short version that hits the major points or we write in whatever is different. Well, I think then Adolfo could get started on having the conversation with the insurance team and see what you come up with. Yep, I could do that. So um, let me make sure I'm synthesizing this right and I'll make it in the form of a motion. Um, I, I move that we authorize um, town manager Ballone to reach out to the insurance company, clarify to our insurer, clarify the liability issues here. And then contingent upon that, we adopt a new form to be developed to um, enable Raman to post a banner on the, the, the cables that exist between RACDC and Northfield uh, through October 31st, 2020. Does that seem to cover the, all the bases? I'll make a motion to second that and then we can talk about it, right? <laughs> so yeah, I'll, second, I'll second it. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? 
Hearing none, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. There, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next Marjorie, I, I told you to check in around six o'clock thinking we'd be ready for you then, but uh, <laughs> Good. who knew? Who knew? Next up on the agenda is the Arts and Culture Committee sculpture display. And I am going to, if you'll just give me a minute, I have some remarks to address that. And I just want to pull them up here. So give me a second. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so the uh, Marjorie Ryerson, who has joined us um, this evening and, and who is a member of the Randolph Arts and Culture Committee has become increasingly uh, uh, collaborative or in partnership with Roz Burgess, who for the past seven years at the direction of former town manager Mal Adams uh, has been maintaining the gardens and park uh, at uh, Forest and Elm Streets at the gateway to the village. And uh, after being contacted by Marjorie on Roz's behalf, uh, an internationally acclaimed sculptor and artist here in Randolph, who many of you may know, Paul Coulter, has graciously agreed to create a garden-sized sculpture to be uh, donated to the to be gifted to the city. The sculpture is called Lemon Lily, and the intention is to erect this in the central garden at what the community has come to know as the so-called Roz's Garden. Uh, Paul is willing to gift this to the the city. The um, this is contingent upon our uh, executing a contract with uh, Paul that would recognize the gift and that would also assure Paul that if the, it, in the unlikely event that that garden um, uh, falls into disrepair or ceases to exist, that the gift would be uh, that the gift of the sculpture would be returned to Paul or his heirs in times in the future. Um, Marjorie has done an extraordinary amount of, of, of background work to um, determine how this sculpture might be installed. Uh, that has included uh, the gifting of a granite uh, post to which the sculpture would be attached from uh, Jeremiah Bernard of Green Valley Memorials. He's offered to gift the post to the town for the erection of this and installation of this uh, sculpture from, and uh, it would be uh, the, the only cost that would be incurred on uh, Jeremiah's end would be for cutting the uh, granite post to the appropriate size for installation below grade on a concrete pad uh, in the existing garden. Jeremiah estimates that that polishing and cutting of the post to size would be approximately at a cost of $400. The only additional cost then would be for the digging of a hole sufficient to uh, mitigate frost heaving uh, and the placement uh, in that hole, uh, below grade hole of a concrete pad on which the post would be installed. Uh, and so essentially we're, we're looking at uh, executing a contract with Paul Coulter here for the gifting of the, of the sculpture with, uh, with assurances that it would be returned to him and his family in the event the garden ceases to exist. And then um, essentially having the Randolph Building and Grounds Department work with experienced installers of these kinds of sculptures and granite posts. And, and in this case, that would possibly be um, the, the uh, Green Valley Memorials team of Dale and Jeremiah Bernard uh, and installing this, hopefully installing this uh, sculpture uh, in a time frame prior to uh, the first deep freeze of this coming season. Small footnote, Tom, if I may. Yeah. Their last name is Barnard. Dale Did Barnard. I say Bernard? I'm sorry. 
<laughs> My bad. I corrected I've been driving you. through Bern uh, <laughs> Okay, thank you. And the whole suite of the gardens, Roz didn't just maintain, she actually built them. And there are many, yeah. many gardens. It's not just the sculpture goes in the center garden, but there, she has built gardens all around that park area. So and, she's, and, uh, she's to be credited for all of those. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, for those of you who have, who have not had the opportunity, and maybe many of you have had the opportunity to go up there and see uh, Roz's handiwork. This sculpture would be an extraordinary addition to, um, and really an honor, uh, an homage to Roz for all the work that she's done. The other thing I would say on behalf of the Arts and Culture Committee, of which both Marjorie and I are members, is that one of the things we have talked about um, <laughs> Uh, extensively in the several months that we've been in Entity is the creation of a sculpture walk in the village that would extend really all the way from the VTC campuses and the, the campus and the Paul Coulter sculptures are, that are there through uh, Jim Sardonis's Whale Dance, Karen Peterson's sculptures at um, the Vermont Veterans Cemetery in Chandler. This would be an addition of a sculpture to the sculpture walk at the very gateway to the village in a gorgeous space that is the product of years of work by one woman. Um, and it would be an honor uh, uh, for her. And it would also be um, a really beautiful piece to bring to that garden. Um, a couple questions. Um, did you get a quote on the concrete pad? No, we have not. Um, we have not done that. Um, Marjorie, you haven't looked into that at all, have you? I don't believe in our discussions that um, we. You told me the town would pour the concrete, so I have not well, looked into that. Yeah, yeah. But well, I, I mean, have. I have a neighbor who has a concrete mixer. He offered to lend us if we wanted to just buy the material at Central Supplies. Mm -hmm. So it could be a fairly simple, inexpensive task. Yeah, yeah. And the post needs to be embedded in the concrete, not set on it. It really needs to be made very secure so no one will steal the sculpture ever. And also, it's primarily to address the frost heaving um, aspect of things, too. And this is where, um, while the building and grounds department might do the installation, they would need to do it under the expert guidance of um, individuals who are experienced in this kind of uh, installation. Um, it's similar, I would think, to what might be done in a cemetery if someone has a small obelisk on their gravesite or family gravesite. Um, I, I would think in this environment to mitigate frost heave, that would also have to be placed into some kind of a concrete base. Um, but no, we've not gotten a quote for that. So the other thing is, um, have you talked about, um, or is your group the right group to talk about naming the park something after Roz? It seems like if we're going to put a sculpture there, we ought to have a name for the park. Uh, we've we've only had sort of behind the scenes conversations about that. Ra, uh, Marjorie and, and Adolfo and I have talked about this. Um, and um, my understanding is that there has been some um, very informal discussions about naming the park. Uh, and uh, I, I, my, my recommendation is that we get the sculpture in place um, prior to the winter and maybe look at having some kind of dedication ceremony that might include um, the naming of the park, whether it be in Roz's honor or just the formal naming of it, um, sometime in the spring of 2021, when all of her incredible handiwork is in full bloom. Uh, and uh, again, thanks to Marjorie's um, work, um, it, it so happens that Paul Coulter is also a musician and has a musical group. And so for example, we might be able to have a public dedication ceremony, renaming the park officially and 
celebrating uh, Raz's handiwork and Paul's sculpture once we get through this COVID-19 uh, And Trini, uh, excuse me, Tom. Yeah. I, I have reached out to the Garden Club and talked to them about the continuity of protecting these gardens after Roz steps down from what she's doing. And I also reached out to Elijah Hawks, the principal, to, to figure out if students could do community service under the guidance of an adult who would maintain the gardens that Roz has designed. She's put an unbelievable amount of time into designing these gardens. She knows everything about what she's done and is meticulous about it. And so I, I want to figure out, and Paul was very concerned about this, but I want to figure out a way to keep these gardens going for the next hundred years or whatever it takes so that we can make sure that park stays maintained as a gift to Randolph. Uh, um, I would also add um, in, in terms of assuring the perpetuity of the park and there, thereby the sculpture, I see, I see uh, my fellow Rotarian and president of the um, Sunrise Rotary Club, um, Sonny Holt here and I um, want to point out that the Sunrise Rotary Club has built a garden shed for Roz uh, at that Elm Street location. And just today at the meeting of the Noontime Rotary Club, we had a brief discussion about um, service projects that that club might take on. And one of the things that came up was how can we come together as a community to assure the survival and the maintenance of this park in, in perpetuity. And I, I, I think it's reasonable to assume the Rotary Clubs might get involved. Um, certainly the Randolph Garden Club, um, uh, such as it is. Um, I, I think it's just a, an if extraordinary, I, you know. If I may interject, uh, the Sunrise Rotary Club has already decided to take on as one of its projects and I, I think the town has already approved this uh, to provide uh, uh, benches to be put up in the garden. People do that. Right. So uh, this is an extraordinary person who has created an extraordinary um, resource and, and, and a really restful, peaceful space for this community. Uh, and and now we've got an extraordinary artist who's willing to step up and gift to the community um, a sculpture that will further enhance. So I, I, I hope that we can find a way to uh, make this happen. I, I can't believe that the, um, I, I simply don't believe that the cost of, of pouring a concrete platform and properly installing this post and sculpture is going to be that exorbitant. Um, uh, I'm not sure who we might go to to seek um, quotes on that or whether building grounds could explore the means of doing it themselves. Um, the biggest issue, and, and uh, Marjorie has raised this because Roz has raised it, is how do we put that post into the center of an existing garden without unduly disrupting the flora that's already there and in place. And the rock, uh, rock pathways through the garden and everything. Right. We're not going to, um, we can't just go in with a huge backhoe and dig a four foot hole and pour concrete into it. It's going to have to be done a little bit um, judiciously. But uh, uh, if there are, given that the post is being gifted, given that the sculpture is being gifted, um, I would hope that we can find some discretionary funds to cover the cost of proper installation. Um, and you've all seen in our packet tonight is a photograph of Paul's work. And those of you who have all been up to the gardens um, know how beautiful they are. And Paul's work would only further enhance that beauty. So. So have you looked at volunteers to help with this? I'm just thinking we know we've got a money problem in the town budget and I know you're you've got 400 for the polishing we don't know what the concrete is if we have to do a very specialized dig in the middle of that garden to avoid damage 
and we have to pay somebody to come in to oversee installation and whatnot, there's a lot of variables there, two of which could get pretty costly. Um, I'm all Jeannie, for the, the area for the concrete pour is so small that I think what we could get volunteers from, and Sonny, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, is that we could get a couple of members of the Rotary with some shovels to dig the hole. I don't think it's a complicated task. And we can mix the concrete and pour it in the hole. How big is the, the uh, granite post? The, the granite post is currently 12 feet long. And no, 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 she dimensions. Meant, the hole to fit the post would be how big? Well, we, the concrete base has to be bigger than the post. But the, you know, the post, I don't have an exact measurement from Jeremiah, who said he was willing to give this post to the town and we could cut off the piece we needed from it. But he was guessing it was 12 feet, 12 inches square. 20, yeah, know, so we're, we're probably talking a two foot by two foot hole here, right? Exactly. Can't, right. Can't be, exactly. I mean, this, is, this is, you know, they sell post hole diggers at Central Supplies, you know. Well, and I suspect- It's not that all, complicated. I think it's just pretty simple. It's very know. simple. You're okay. Right. It's so inexpensive it's inexpensive and simple. So, it's, so, so, so I think you're right. You go find some volunteers. You know, there's probably some folks out there that would be willing to contribute some money. Um, I don't have much of a problem finding funds for when I need to find things for Winterfest. And as you saw for the 4th of July, I think you can raise some cash here from some of the members of the community to cover this expense. And I think everybody sees the value in that garden. Um, you know, I stopped and talked to Roz the other day. I think you were there just after I was. And she's excited about it. I, you know, she's like, I, you know, this was something she's wanted to see happen now for whatever, seven years. So, you know, now she's finally, you know, something's going to happen there. And I think it's a great addition. So I think there's a plenty of volunteer people out there that'd be more than happy to cough up what you need here. Fun wise. I agree. I agree. Yep. Find it pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And Trini, the, the cutting is not $400. The cutting is $100 to cut the post. And um, if we want to wait until late September, Forrest McGregor is coming back from North Carolina with equipment with which he could cut the post for us. But it being $100 and the need to get this, part, this sculpture installed before fall it gets late, I think we should just go ahead and find the $100. It's not a big deal. The polishing, Jeremiah said, would cost about $300. But I don't, right. you know, I think we can, we can figure out how to find those funds fairly readily. From outside of the town. Right. Budget. Well, right. from outside I mean, of the town budget, right? Yeah, I, I think you're going to have no problem. I think that's a real easy lift. I'd be willing to bet if we asked every member of the Arts and Culture Committee to give $25, they would. You know, I think we can make it happen pretty easily. Yeah, so basically all you need from us is permission to do it? Well, what we need is, a, a per, per, um, per my discussions with Adolfo, um, I'm prepared to just put together a motion that basically says that we authorize town manager Bellone to execute a contract with artist Paul Coulter spelling out um, Paul's donation of the sculpture to the town of Randolph for installation in what I'm calling Roz's garden for now. Um, the contract must also include a clause stating that the town will return the sculpture to the owner of Paul Coulter and or his heirs in the unlikely event that the garden site is not maintained in perpetuity. Uh, so uh, that's basically what we're asking for. And um, I noticed that on the action steps, the action sheet that Adolfo has provided us with, and I'm perfectly comfortable with this. Let me just pull that up. Um, ah, where did it go? Basically, Adolfo, if I recall, you stated that said contract would not be executed until we identify an installation plan and the cost thereof. Have I got that right? Uh, it sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to make that, um, that motion. And I'd also like to add to the motion that we try um, our best to um, get this whole thing um, installed uh, prior to, I had put October 15th uh, initially uh, in a motion I drafted, but uh, I think we could extend it to October 31st. The key thing is to get it into the ground prior to the first deep freeze. 
Second that. Any further discussion? I have a question. Are the pictures that we have, are they the actual sculpture? Yes, they are, correct, Marjorie? Yes, that's the actual sculpture. I, I, I don't know what, you have multiple pictures. I sent one picture to Tom. I but, think you have two pictures. But I have two pictures on my phone and he has it sitting on a concrete base that he had in his house, but. It looks like cinder blocks to me. Right, or whatever it was, right. Couple on the bottom, yeah. It's approximately two and a half feet high. And, and he he built it, well, I'll read this. He he said he, he built it out of six crescents arrayed around a central point. And he said, Hexagam, hexagrams and hexagons have historically been used for protection against misfortune and as a good luck symbol. So I thought that was a very sweet thought on Paul's part to make a, a sort of a good luck sculpture for the town of Randolph. Perfect, we need and some. He more. put every, every other job of his aside after I asked him, put them on hold and did this, concentrated on it for the last couple of months and finished it last week. Perfect. Sounds like Paul. Sounds like Tom. Okay. Sounds like Paul. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Paul. Like me. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? If not, we'll move the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? We seem to have lost Larry. Oh, so. he's He's moved away from his mountain home. Yeah, yeah he's probably gone on a walk. Um, oh, I'll record that uh, vote. Uh, I, I see him on, I see him listed on the meeting. I just don't know if he voted. No, no, he's just disappeared from the screen. He's gone he for a little walked bit. Away. Oh, he just walked he's, up the mountain or okay. something. I'll I'll list that vote. Vote. Marjorie, may I ask that you put um, Paul directly in contact with Adolfo to, begin working on the contract? Does that seem appropriate? And I would suggest the opposite. I would suggest that uh, we form a simple contract from the town and send it to Paul stating just what you said, Tom. And, you know, okay. just All right. accept his gift and we are very grateful for it. I don't think it needs to be legally authorized. And, you know, he's a sculptor and a musician, and I think we just write something simple, thanking him for this gift and acknowledging that we will return it to him if the park is not maintained into the future. And I'm happy as a writer to help Adolfo with that simple right. contract, but I don't think we need to involve Paul in it. I think okay. he, yeah. he just yeah. was worried that it could be, the park could deteriorate and his sculpture would sit there in high weeds and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it can be simple, but I think we have to bend over backwards to thank him. And I'm, I'm more than happy to show up with my shovel on the day when. Uh... I have I have multiple shovels. I'll come too. I read a postal log. <laughs> Younger. <laughs> hey, this is good conversation. Okay. The agenda yeah. stuff. <laughs> Let's go. Moving forward on uh, grants, we have a COVID nineteen grant the CDBG and the digitalizing land records. Yes, uh, I would like to ask the board to consider approving or authorizing the town to apply for uh, COVID-19 grants that have been recently been made available through the state. Um, some of the specifics of the grants were, um, are still yet to be developed by the state agencies that are uh, managing these more specifically, the CDBG CV grant. Um, guidance was issued early on. Guidance was, was changed after the state received additional information from the federal government. Um, so we are, we're working on getting to the final guidance so that we can apply for a grant uh, Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the more recent guidance for the CDBG CV grant is that uh, grants would have to be made available to nonprofits that provide a service uh, like providing food uh, for those in need or providing housing for those in need. It's not so much restricted to just nonprofits. In terms of Randolph's um, case, because 
the percentage of low to moderate income individuals has changed recently from HUD's calculations. Um, you know, any one project in the town does not meet the, the requirements for the percentage of individuals 80% below area of median income. So any project that is applied for has to be very specific to benefit low to moderate income individuals, right? So right. Be before when we, when we started talking about this at a, at a municipal level, um, that was not known. And we had conversations of what, what public services the municipality provides to the community um, could we then uh, create an application for. Um, but since the, the income um, guideline change, you know, we were not able to do that. I have had conversations with, with Julie um, and some other organizations in the community um, about some of the needs of their clients um, who are traditionally um, would fit into that low to moderate income individual status. Um, and so those are ongoing, but the reality is, is that a lot of this information came out from the state and they are requiring us to go through the, the same BCDB process uh, in a very short window of time. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're still trying to still trying to figure out if, if we can pull this off and is there a, a project that would be competitive and, and, and helpful. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to just roll with information as best as we can. So the, the, the request would be um, to authorize staff to um, seek out a project. Um, I think it's less, less uh, detailed focus for the digitizing land records grant than it would be for the CDBG CV grant. Um, but because of the tight deadline, tight deadlines, I don't believe that um, we we can wait until the next meeting next month to to, to share what the project would be, unless there right. was a special meeting. That's correct because um, the the application deadline is September eighth, um, and again because of the VCDP. Um, requirements of having a public hearing um, and then you need to have the public hearing at least five days before the application due date. Um, it's, it's really, you know, we're, we can try to develop an application over the, the next week and that's, that's just about it. Josh, did you say you're working with Julie to see what there might be for projects? Julie has communicated to me some ideas for some projects, yes. So can this be the public hearing, Josh? No. <laughs> <laughs> Would it were that simple, huh? On the agenda. <laughs> yeah, no, it has to go through the whole, you know, the same 15-day um, warning in the paper. Um, when was it in the paper, Adolfo? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I know. I. Uh... Right. Yeah. We're. I mean, it's 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 one of those things where, um, unfortunately, the the process is going to, you know, re reduce, you know, some possible participation just because the, the time frame is so short. How do you, you know, coming up with a project, um, like that in in August when people are on vacations and, and it's, just, it's just really hard to pull off. But I think, you know, speaking with Adolfo, I think it was important to, to get the select board's um, view on it because there was a chance that we could come up with a project. Um, it would be focused on uh, a, a demographic that is low to moderate income um, that might help them um, in, in meeting the challenges that that they have encountered because of COVID, um, that's in essence what the the grant is looking to do. So I, I, I'll just highlight one of the ideas that Julie had had um, 
tossed out to me was um, utilizing technology for seniors um, in their residences so that they can be more engaged with what's going on um, so that they're not, they don't feel as isolated so that they can still participate, you know, um, in community life, but also be safe um, in the confines of their residence. Seniors are traditionally the demographic that uh, meets that low to moderate income uh, definition. Um, so that would be an opportunity there. I think it's worth the effort um, if we have a project that makes sense of, of putting it in, uh, even if it means we have to hold a special Zoom meeting. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, if you've got some target projects, I think you might as well launch it. Can't hurt. And I think the senior one's probably a really good one, so. I'll move that we approve the planning grant application. I'll second it. For conversation, we're not approving the app. Are we approving an application or are we approving them to develop an application? To develop an application, right? Yes. I don't right. Know. So our next meeting will work so that there'd be time enough. The application due date is September 8th. So um, we would we would have to have a public hearing before that. Um, yeah, by by the 3rd of September. Is that doable? It's it's possible. <laughs> It's possible. possible. <laughs> I'm looking at Julie and you right now because it sounds like you guys have got it. So is it doable? So I'm just asking. If you think it's doable, then I think I'm good with it. Yep. Barely. Yeah. There's some talk that they may extend it, but as usual, it's mostly talk at this point. So um There's a lot of extensions. <laughs> just ask me. <laughs> I know about them. Yeah. It's physically I mean, doable, but if the application is not trivial, so we would have to settle. I, I mean, I'm happy to help, whatever whatever the decision is. Um, but some work. Yep. So we have a motion to ask Josh and Julie to go forth and develop a application. Look. Is that correct, Pat? Yes. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Housekeeping item, Larry, the sculpture park, the sculpture to receive to go into Roz's park, you had stepped away when we voted. Do you want to remain as abstained? Do you want to go on record for something I'll, else? I'll, I'll go on record approving that. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Trini. Thanks, Larry. Wanted to move you out of the abstention if you wanted to be out. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Kimball yeah, Library. Julie, Julie and Josh should get back to work probably at this point. <laughs> On the application. <laughs> Especially if we have to have a public hearing before September 3rd. Um, yeah, I was actually looking. I, I actually got a piece of artwork with the same conditions that uh, Paul uh, Paul made, and I was trying to find that template from the Arts Council for you. I'll, I'll have to do that offline. That'd be very helpful. Thank you. I'm sure Adolfo would appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Next up, we have the Kimball Library grant requests. Uh, the two grant requests um, provided by Kimball are the traditional requests made every year. Uh, the courier grant request and the community connect request. Um, there has been there previously made uh, been comments about the amount of the grants. Um, they're typically under a thousand dollars with a local match uh, that is provided that is matched by Kimball. Uh, Amy has 
every year said that she does not mind that we apply or that she applies for these that these amounts um, and continues to submit requests to the select board every year. Adolfo, is a courier grant, is that a courier like they deliver stuff to people who might need stuff delivered? No, my understanding is a courier grant is, uh, it's a part of uh, interlibrary exchange. So it's folks who check out a book at a different library. If it's only here at Kimball, it will be delivered from Kimball to that other library and then back. Ah. Okay, I'll make a motion that we uh, authorize uh, Amy to secure these grants or apply for the grants. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Let's go kids infant capacity grant. I think it's grow kids. Close to both. Let's, let's grow kids. Yep. Oh, yep. Yeah, sorry. I left that part out. Yep. Um, this is, this is me. Um, but let's grow kids. So this is um, a grant opportunity opportunity that's coming up um, again uh, with a due date in September. Um, and um, as, as you might be familiar with the municipal planning grant that we were awarded at the beginning of this year to do a child care assessment, um, which is ongoing. Um, and actually, um, we had a, a meeting yesterday um, that where the consultant delivered uh, more of the deliverables. So her work is just about done. Um, she's done the assessment. She's um, done some reviews of, of properties um, and has developed um, business plan, financials, um, and a strategy uh, for the child care task force and uh, the town of Randolph to to utilize. Um, and so um, Let's Grow Kids has this grant opportunity and there's still some work to be done. Um, and we've been encouraged to apply for this because Let's Grow Kids is aware of the, the municipal planning grant that we were awarded and the work that our consultant has done. Um, and as well as individuals at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Um, and so we've been encouraged to, to, to apply for this grant to help with phase two of this project, which would be um, to um, hire um, a consultant to manage the project, which would involve um, engineering of a potential site um, and um, uh, reaching out to a potential vendor um, and helping them get familiar with regulations, just trying, trying to find the right vendor that would take over this space and, and just help with that process. We know that, um, there's still, you know, we still need to secure a property in this project, but Let's Grow Kids has told us that this is the way for us to get into the pipeline. We, we, we uh, submit an application and then they will put us into a direction that best meets the needs for childcare in the region. This grant opportunity is specific to creating um, new infant and toddler childcare spaces. Um, so this is what, this is what our, our project um, is in essence doing. Um, we've identified uh, a, a demand of about a hundred um, spaces um, with many of them being infant and toddler. Um, and so we would, we would like, we, now we don't know uh, to be honest, we don't know who who should be the right entity to apply. Um, we had a meeting yesterday and we were informed by Let's Grow Kids that the town uh, can apply, GMEDC can apply, or 
a uh, community group like just the task force can apply. Um, that's something that we were not that we didn't know about until yesterday. So um, I think in general, the town is supportive of this kind of work. Um, and so that's why I, I had asked Adolfo to, to have this on the agenda. Um, and, and hopefully the, the select board would um, agree for us to, to seek funding for this. Um, and if and it turns out that the, the child care task force um, can apply and, and they're willing to do that, then we would support them uh, any way we can. Um, but this, this is a grant opportunity that does not have a match requirement. Um, the capital is really flexible and they have some um, flexibility in how much money they will uh, dole out for projects. This particular grant is capped at 50,000. However, for projects that meet a regional need, as this would, um, there's another pot of funds that um, they can they can dip into if there's um, increased project expenses. So um, that's a little that's a little update on, on, on this grant opportunity. Any Comments, questions, thoughts on whether the town should be the applicant? Is there, any is there any negative reason for why we wouldn't want to be the applicant? Any? The only one would be if there's a match requirement, right? Would want yeah. to be how that would be made. You know, do but, they allow any kind? But, do we have partners? Right. So there's no match requirement, so. Right, there's, there's no match. Um, you know, GMEDC is, is obviously able to apply to. However, um, they are also the entity that would be the lead on securing um, any property for this. So um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe that, that it would make sense for them to take this one on in addition. Um, yeah, well, I, and 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 we, you know, there is ongoing conversations about this with the enterprise center. So, seems like I can't see a reason for the town not to apply for this. Is that a motion? Is that a motion? <laughs> 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 sure, I'll make the motion that the town apply for this grant. <laughs> I will second. Any further questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you. Awesome. Municipal planning grant. We received uh, notice earlier this week, I believe, I'm sorry, I believe mid last week that the municipal planning grant process is now open. Um, just with the timing, we thought it may be best to share information with the select board and ask for approval to potentially apply for a municipal planning grant. Uh, those typically have, uh, I believe it's a 10% match. Um, the do not have a specific project in mind, although Josh and I did briefly discuss the possibility of applying for a municipal planning grant to have a full review of the Branchwood property for potential housing. Um, it's, it's one that I know the, the select board has discussed in the past that uh, members individually have uh, expressed interest in. And if we were to secure a grant, uh, for a municipal planning grant, we could hire um, um, someone to perform a review and share it with the board about what housing at that location would look like and, and how it would work. Questions? 
questions, comments? Sounds reasonable. Need a motion? I'll move that we apply for that municipal planning grant. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. I read your lips to be an aye, Perry. He <laughs> <laughs> seems to be munching away on something. So Josh, is that on a different schedule than the other planning grant? Yes, it is a it's a different schedule and it's a different process altogether. Um, the this one is not due until October, um, and there's there's no public hearing that has to happen, so it doesn't have to follow that uh, that process. Great. So next on the agenda is old business. And we will start with the sign ordinance revision. So the select board had re previously reviewed the um, revisions to the sign ordinance. I had the process uh, confused. I was following a process for changes to the land use regulations, uh, which included a number of different other tasks. Um, after connecting with our attorney and then also speaking with Sonny, we realize that the process is less cumbersome than the land use regulations change. But by that point, we had missed a deadline to post um, copies of the ordinance throughout the town and then also to advertise in our local newspaper. So um, rather than create a problem by just moving forward, I thought it best just restart the process, uh, ask the board to re to reconsider it again. And if it were to approve, the process now requires me to post um, either a summary of the ordinance, the proposed changes with our local newspaper, and then post five different copies of the paper throughout the town for, for review. Uh, and then at that point, the town would have up to 60 days to appeal um, the changes through their own process, which would just require um, an appeal process to, to, to cancel the changes to the side ordinance. And if nothing is, is collected within that period of time, then the changes to the side ordinance would go into effect within 60 days of the select board adopting them. So if they, the select board were to adopt the ordinance today and no changes were to be requested or a challenge to them, then they would go into effect 60 days as of today. So 60 days after the public hearing or 60 days? There would be no public hearing required. It would be 60 days as of the vote of today. Okay. Contingent upon town staff posting the notices in the Herald and posting the five copies throughout the town for folks to be able to, to read them. <clears throat> so w w one issue that I'd like to raise goes back to the discussion we had earlier this evening, which is a question. I know that the existing draft of the sign ordinance that's before us makes references uh, in one area to banners on the downtown light post banner arms. Um, but there's no discussion of any um, potential banner that may go in any location across Main Street again. And I'm wondering if we shouldn't um, incorporate that language into um, the sign ordinance as well. Uh, yeah, if, if I may, uh, why, why don't I read the, uh, the current change about banners in the okay. proposed sign ordinance? Okay. And, uh, we, we did address it, okay? Okay. It's, uh, it's, uh, it comes in under banners over public road, okay? 
An okay. organization a person wishing to install a banner across Main Street or any other public street in the town shall receive permission by the select board prior to installation. Such permission shall be granted if the design of the banner is not offensive to common sensibilities. The organization or person granted such permission shall be responsible for installing and maintaining the banner. The applicant shall provide a certificate of insurance showing commercial and general liability insurance in the amount required by the select board. That was the form that Tony was talking about earlier. The okay. town of Randolph needs to be named as an additional insured on the policy. The approved banner shall be removed within seven days after the event it is promoting takes place. The town accepts no responsibility for any injuries incurred during the installation or removal of the banner, nor during the time it is in place. Uh, we, we felt we didn't want to get more specific than that, okay? Uh, in, in any case, uh, if someone wants to install a banner, you know, they have to go to the select board and get permission from the select board, you know, with the liability uh, applications and all of that. Uh, if you get too specific on that paragraph on banners, uh, then you may run into problems. Okay. So, so Sonny, that would apply to, um, that language would apply to the discussion we had earlier this evening relative to the banners between Red Lion and, yeah, um, yes. and yes. presumably if we did in the future erect the poles that um, Trini spoke of along the bridge at either the foot of the bridge or either end, um, it would also apply to that as yes. well. Okay. Yes. Yeah, just, just one comment on uh, on banners. Uh, probably what caused the damage to those buildings in the past uh, is probably heavy winds. Even though you have a banner that has cutouts in it, you know, to uh, mitigate the wind velocity, you have to be very careful. You know, if you get banners, if you get wind powerful enough, uh, it can rip apart quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. So if you can have that banner up there for, you know, two months, uh, you ought to pay a lot of attention to the weather and uh, see what storms might be coming through. You may want to take it down. That's yeah. why I like the idea of having the poles, you know, over the bridge and the, they should be solid poles and you should be able to raise them by hand and take them down by hand in, in, in a hurry if you need to. So that's, that's my uh, comment. And, and the, the other question I would have is, um, in the context of that language, who determines what is offensive to public? Um, that, how do you define what is offensive to public uh, taste or whatever the wording was there? Yeah, yeah, we, we had a discussion on that. And, uh, and I guess in the final analysis, uh, I think the select board can make a ruling on that. I mean, you wouldn't want a bunch of swear words. Right no, obviously, the or, you yeah. know, nudes or anything like that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I i think the select board could decide you know that that's uh, quite all right yeah 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 but otherwise, otherwise i don't think there is uh, any any changes needed uh, julie initially wanted to make changes uh to that particular um yeah. paragraph and i mentioned to her that you know she could incorporate those changes tonight or discuss them tonight uh, I don't think they were that, uh, you know, real. Uh, yeah, of, of real import. And the, lang she the language she sent to me was in an email was specific to the cables across Main Street, and it sounds like this language embraces that without getting into that level of specificity. So, yeah, yeah. we, yeah, we, we left out where the cables would be or anything like that. You don't yeah. want to get specific no. right exactly it's too far in the weeds yeah so if if the the, the process I, I did forget to include one item to, to share with the board the process to commence the adoption of the of the new sign ordinance would also include that uh, uh shannon and i place the full text of the proposed sign ordinance into the minutes of the meeting so the full text of the new ordinance would be in the meeting minutes five copies would have to be placed in conspicuous places throughout the town for review 
and a summary of the min of the uh, changes would have to be uh, published in the local newspaper, and that we can all do fairly quickly. Adolfo, I think you could use those uh, talking points that I provided with you. Uh, you that could go into the uh, the newspaper for the as far as the major changes. Those have been very helpful, Sonny. Thank you very much for having done that. Those have been very helpful. So the, uh, is there any place in the ordinance that restricts public banners from having content that's political or religious, any of those things? Uh, or is that left up to whoever's on the board at the yeah. time? Throughout the entire sign ordinance, we uh, we scrubbed that uh, pretty prolifically, and we took out uh, anything that might have uh, been favored uh, one organization over another organization. Uh, there's nothing that would be considered against uh, free speech uh, in the current sign ordinance. We we basically complied with that Supreme Court decision. You know, that went up to the Supreme Court and uh, it was a town of Gilbert uh, that sued their town uh, because they were restricting a sign uh, put up by a church. So right now, any signs have to be content neutral. Uh, that, gu that guarantees free speech. Do we define content neutral? I, th I think that's in the... Uh, in, in the major portion uh, of it. Uh, let me see if I can't find that. Yeah, I was looking at the definitions. Okay. I don't think we have the definitions per se, but uh, let's see. Uh, it says the uh, design ordinance proposes a content neutral signage code based on the Supreme Court's decision of Reed versus Town of Gilbert. It recognizes that government signs a government speech intended to ensure public safety, but must also be interpreted in a manner consistent with the First Amendment guarantee of free speech. That's up in the, uh, the introduction to the ordinance. It's basically say you you can't rule for or against a sign uh, based on its content. <laughs> well, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, it could be a problem. Yeah, uh, right. they, you know, there's uh, you know a lot, a lot of people uh, feel that they want to say what they want to say, and uh, well, but you can't you can't deny it. How, how does that dovetail with the? Um, uh, what what you read to us earlier about offensive to the public, I, I, I'm forgetting the exact language, but yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, off offensive to public sensibilities, right? I mean, and, what, uh, one man's ceiling is another man's floor. You know, it's just yeah. yeah. I, I I think the uh, select board, uh, you know, in their good judgment, could say, uh, yeah, that's free speech. Uh, but it, it goes too far in this uh, in this content. It may go up yeah. to the Supreme Court. You may win, you may lose. But I think basically what the sign ordinance says right now is uh, you can't really rule for or against a sign based solely on its content. I can see a slippery slope. Yeah, there's, there's always that possibility. Well, you your approval is all subjective. We've removed any any barriers, any you know parameters for it. Well, we haven't done that. The Supreme Court's done it for us, right? I mean, in essence. Um, Perry, you're, you're muted. Perry, you're muted. He doesn't have his headphones in. Uh, hold on, there we go. There we go. So anyways, yes, the sign is correct. This created 
you know, one or two meetings and some pretty healthy, robust discussions about that situation. So I think that, uh, as Trini's right, it's a slippery slope, but I don't see any way around, you know, what could possibly come up as somebody wants to put a sign up. I mean, we, we talked about this in great length, so. The the uh, the current the current ordinance has has phrases like uh, you know for different types of signs and then it gave an example you know for example uh, 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 a church meeting time okay and it gave maybe three other examples okay uh, what would be approved well if you go strictly on those three or four examples you're excluding everything else okay so what we did we basically took out those exclusions uh, on any sign that said you know, here, here's what's appropriate or, or what is not appropriate. So if I have a business and some people find it offensive and I put in my application for the sign and the sign ordinance approver, whoever it is, um, doesn't like my business, can they claim that it's offensive and not issue the permit? I think it would have to go to the select board. I, I don't. I don't think the uh, the sign ordinance, uh, the signage officer, who in this case is Josh. I, I if I if I could add Trini an example that um, actually real world example of what happened about two years ago, I believe there was discussion within the state legislature of allowing. Um, the sale of marijuana at different storefronts. And when that discussion was ongoing here at town hall, we received a number of calls. I wouldn't say a lot, but we received calls from residents saying the town needs to block these. They can't be in the village. They can't be in the village. Uh, after discussion internally among staff, we realized that we, we couldn't, there, there was no mechanism for town government to not allow a business if it was an approved legal business yes. uh, within the village area. And Trini, to your example, if that conversation were to happen again and a uh, marijuana sale uh, company were to open or a business open in the village, they could potentially apply to place a banner on the guy wires over Main Street, which would most likely spark a lot of conversation. Some people would be offended by that. Um, and you know, that's, it's not, that's an example that could happen because it almost did happen about two years ago with the conversation in the state legislature. But if it's a legitimate business under existing state statutes, um, I don't see how we could preclude them from or prohibit them from erecting a banner. I mean, you know, what, whatever we may feel about you know, legalized marijuana or whatever, if if it's a legitimate business operation, uh, I don't see how we could preclude them from putting up a sign or a banner that. Right, that's that's the point. But really, we have to. What we're discussing is, you know, is that a problem? You know. Yeah, it well, could be. It could be a situation where three members of the board are adamantly opposed to it and then decline hanging the banner and then the business then as a case against the town. Yeah, right. That, that's the problem. You, if, if, it's, if it's declined, okay, and it, and it goes up to the courts, uh, you know, the town could uh, <laughs> suffer a lot of uh, mm -hmm. lawyer fees, you know, 250, 300,000, whatever wow. it may cost to fight it, so. I would suggest then that the three select board members who choose to decline, um, you know, <laughs> ha have that burden on their shoulders. Um, the libertarian in me is saying, hey, you know, it's a legitimate business. It's a legitimate advertising um, method. It may not be a business that I approve of, but, you know, yeah. too bad. <laughs> It's not restricted, wouldn't be restricted to just businesses though. There, any, any group could put up. Yeah, but sure. Any organization. Well, yeah, I mean, it goes back to the discussion we had 
several meetings ago about the Black Lives Matter banner in some respects. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to see, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't think we can be policing. We should be in the business of policing content unless it's patently obscene or offensive. Uh, it might be offensive to our personal or political um, but the town might not. But the town might not want to, to be hosting a forum in which controversial views are posted. We might just not want to be a part of that business, right? Like, I think that's really the decision here. Like, if if anybody can post, you know, things from a wide spectrum of views, and in, in this public forum, um, we just need to be prepared for that. And if that's something that we want to possibly see happen then that's fine, but we need to make that decision. You know, if mm -hmm. we want to have a, a potential for, you know, there to be a place for people to post controversial thoughts, that's, you know, a, basically a, a, a town, a townwide forum. Um, I think that's the decision that we're, 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 that we're talking about here. Yeah, no, I don't agree. I, I, I don't disagree at all. Um, so could I, under this sign ordinance, could, somebody apply to put a banner that said Trump 2020 across Main Street? Yes. Sure, yeah. Okay. And then yeah. that's there for 21 days. Well, there comes arguing on both sides, right? Well, then they could have a Biden, Biden one too. So it's like, you just give well, everybody the time limit. It's like, okay, you had your opportunity. No difference, yeah. they're putting signs on all the corners. I'm just saying it's the, you're gonna get that. You're gonna get that conversation you know one pro-life one abortion rights one you know you the hot topics are apt to show up there right ramen will look like a welcome one for a year permit <laughs> well that's assuming that we we <laughs> have you know we approve guy wires across main street either at their current location or on the poles across the bridge that you've speculated could come in the future. Um, the Supreme Court has basically said we, we can't, am I right, Adolfo, that we basically can't control the content. We can contr control the amount of time it's up there for, but um, if, if somebody wants to, you know, pay the price to put a Make America Great Again up there or, um, you know, it's not much. We didn't charge anything, did we? No, we haven't charged anybody. <laughs> so it's make a banner. We'll even put it up for them. You know, Center Fire Department will put it up for them. Oh, I know. Well, that's, why, that's why I wanted to get on the polls so that you didn't have to deal with the fire department. Well, this, this in, in practice, this, this has not been an issue in the past, right? Right. Um, so, and, and it seems like something that's you know nice for the town to have if we if we can have it um i think we should you know continue as we have in the past and if some of the you know one of these scenarios pops up that we're you know afraid of then we can deal with it if it happens we might decide at the end of the day that having a place for people to post all sorts of controversial messages is not something that the town wants to support Right. And so you can just is, make it not available to anyone if that becomes the problem. Right. So that that's yeah, that probably would where we'd end up going is if it becomes that way, then we just have to say none. And that way we're not discriminating against anybody. Yeah. And this is specifically banners we're talking about. What about signage? No, it's for it's for all signs. All, all signs. signs. Okay. Yeah. Well then. I mean, we can't ban signs, right? No, but this, this banner is a particularly noticeable town supported yeah, yeah, yeah. spot. Yeah. So it, it has a kind of a special place. Yeah. Can yeah. we limit the use of the banner location over town to only town information? Like, we, can we uh, box in what the banner's used for so it's used to 
notify people of uh, available resources or events or things like that or no because once we start saying events we're on to pro-life marches and so, so let, let, let me read to you something that julie sent to me um and i think she might have sent this to you as well sonny um banners advertising an event now this is banners not signs banners advertising an event for installation on the banner arms, this is of, of the light posts in the downtown or on cables across Main Street shall only be allowed for town events, town sponsored events, events sponsored by the town's designated downtown organization, or events taking place on town property. So it specifically becomes an event oriented promotion. Is that legally um, in keeping with what the Supreme Court? I think we would have to check with, um, I would have to check with our attorney, but if it's, the challenge is if it's a process that's open to the public, then it has to be content neutral and it's fair game for anyone. But if it's strictly just for government, then there is no, there's, there's no way that the select board can, is essentially controlling the content because it's only a govern, it's only a town dissemination of information for town specific events. So it's not, it's not a, a banner advertisement process open to everyone. It is just the town's method of communicating. All right. um, so it's close to the public. It's just government. Right. Events. So, so let's pick some, you know, specific events then. Um, Winterfest and the Festival of Lights. If we simply, as a select board, endorse those as town-sponsored or town-endorsed events, would we then be able to promote those on a banner across Main Street under the under the um, under what you've just said? Uh, I would have to check with our attorney for that. Um, it does in, in general conversation, it makes sense in that the town would have to vote to be a part of the event as a sponsor or as a, as a co-sponsor or the, the immediate sponsor. But I, I would feel more comfortable saying that I would speak with our attorney before saying yes or no. Okay. When, when, I, when, because... I looked at, when I looked at uh, Julie's comments, uh, I had no problem. Uh, with her recommended changes. Well, yeah. the thing I'd like to say about those things or the events is, is those are all public gatherings. And so the select board issues a permit for those too. So maybe that's the, the way that that can work. That it becomes part of the permitting public gathering process. Well, I mean, it's it's right now. I mean, you know, if you like uh, no, festival no. lights, those things all have to have a town permit for a gathering. So I don't know whether that helps it or doesn't, but. It has been a number of years since I've been involved with this kind of issue, but um, when I was the director of the first night New Year's Eve celebration in Burlington, there was a process in place for getting banners up for events across Main Street in Burlington and also across Route 7 in Burlington. Um, and that process was overseen by the Church Street Marketplace Commission. And you had to apply every year for a one or two week time slot in which you would wanna have your banner up. Now, this is probably before um, the Supreme Court decision, but it was entirely event focused. It was not issues focused. It wasn't ramen, COVID-19 outreach focus. It was strictly for events. Um, and the Church Street Marketplace as a legal entity of the city of Burlington oversaw that process. Um, so maybe that's the key word, it has to be a public event. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, where would the last mile ride fall in? Because they've hung banners up before. Yeah, exactly. Really public event, right? You got to register to participate. No, or what? Well, you have to register for Winterfest too. We ask everybody to register. Where would the New World Festival fall in? You have to buy tickets to it. I mean, 
It's open I don't know. Public. It's open to the public. We give them a public gathering permit. Right. You're not. These are not private events. You're. They're, you're not excluding anybody from coming, even if you are charging. Absolutely. So you know, people have the free right, the will to come. So I don't know. I'd consider them to be public events. I mean, if somebody was going to hold a political rally, well, I guess that could be considered a public event also. Yeah, this is another piece of um, the puzzle. What Julie wrote or what she added to what I presume the Planning Commission had, had written was um, town-sponsored events or events uh, or events taking place on town property. And the issue I raised with her was, well, Chandler is town property. And during my tenure at Chandler, the State Democratic Party rented Chandler for a rally with Congressman Welch and Senator, uh, and, um, Senator Sanders um, uh, probably two years ago now. Now they rented it from Chandler as the leaseholder for, for, for the building, but it's town property. So you get into this issue of, well, you know, would we have to promote the Democratic or the Republican or the Progressive Party's event at Chandler on a town banner or a town approved sign? I, it's it's a, kind of a sticky wicket. If it's helpful, um, you know, I, I could potentially uh, suggest to the board that it, this this topic it could be tabled until I've had the opportunity to speak with our lawyer to see whether the changes that are being proposed by Julie makes sense whether if it's a government only advertisement, can we do that? Or if there's a banner wire process and does it have to be open to everyone? Uh, I could have all of these questions potentially answered by, by our attorney and then I could work with Sonny and then bring it back to the board at, at next month's meeting. I think that makes sense. Could I, could I also suggest Adolfo that maybe and, and again, it's been a couple of years since I've dealt with this issue um, as, as a nonprofit administrator, but could you reach out to the Church Street Marketplace Commission in Burlington and just ask them what the current status of their banner program is and how they're administering it? Sure, absolutely. When you do that, ask them if they're aware of the, of the, of the, 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 the um, Supreme, Supreme Court ruling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just, I mean, they may not know, so. Just be nice to know. Yeah, yeah. I may cause the downfall of that process. Well, it, 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 well <laughs> I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just asking if they're aware of it. Okay, yeah. I could do I, that. I would offer to do that for you, Adolfo, but the <laughs> leadership there has completely changed since I left Burlington. I don't know anybody that's there anymore. Um, and I don't even know if the banner program resides there anymore, but at least a phone call would clarify that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I could do that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And again, that is a totally event-driven um, banner program, whether it's the Discover Jazz Festival or the Champlain Valley Fair or whatever, it's totally event-driven. Well, there's plenty of communities in Vermont that are hanging banners, so I'm sure yeah. the biggest cities and towns or the lawyer or somebody must have a, an answer to the question. Yeah, yeah. Yep, we'll do that. Okay. So, do we need a motion to table? No. No, we'll bring it back on the agenda. Hopefully next month. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up is uh, Norwich Solar. They were we, added to our agenda. We have um, received additional material from Norwich Solar, um, and the material. Um, um, fits with what the select board had requested at the, at the previous meeting, which was to obtain um, confirmation that the neighbors of the property, the Gilderdales, approved of the project. Um, the letter that we did receive, or we received from Brandon, um, it, I don't believe it, it met specifically the details um, of where specifically the array would be, but the signatures do do you know, comply with the Gilderdale's understanding that the project 
is going to be next door to them and that they generally agree to a general area. Yeah, we do I, have I, Brandon Malley here from yeah, uh, but Norwich Solar. Before Brandon gets on, Adolfo, uh, I, I took a look at what Brandon sent in. Along with that was a, a plot plan for the revised uh, installation of the solar array. It has been moved uh, from the original uh, position and uh, it does clear uh, the view for the Gilderdales, and uh, I, I think it's uh, it's fine. It's a it's a good plan. Go ahead, Brendan. Um, thank you. And uh, and yeah, the, uh, the plan that accompanies the letter um, uses a an existing reference point on the property, a a, a pin and a stump uh, as this. Uh, the, what we what we use as an agreed upon point to reference the array uh, limits off of, so um, so there's kind of an independent basis for the change. So um, happy to answer any questions, um, and I just wanted to say I appreciated the time of everyone involved, planning commission and select board. I think it's a good result for the neighbors, and um, really we uh, we appreciated the opportunity to go through the process. So Brendan, can you just answer uh, one quick question? When it mm -hmm. says um, the array is going to be installed as far east as practical, generally illustrated, the uh, I do a lot of contract administration and the words generally um, and as practical make me a little nervous. So I, is there I, any scenario under which this would move west through the process to the point where it would be a problem for them? Or are you saying if you can't get it within that area where it's not in their view shed, you might have to make a smaller project? Right. Uh, so it'll be as far east as practical, but not west of the agreed upon point. OK. Thank you. So, um, uh, and that that point is the there's an existing iron pin and a and a stump um, that uh, is is there at the property line, and it's referenced on the plan. Great, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So, with this, you now are looking for us to approve the letter, and you didn't like Adolfo's signature on it. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, it, it hadn't, it turned out it hadn't actually been signed by the Planning Commission yet. Um, uh, and um, Select Board had uh, approved it to be signed. So the request is, um, is to have uh, you sign it and, and also uh, uh, the Planning Commission. Sonny. Yeah, we. We're, we, we've been holding off on our signature be, because we wanted to go through the select board first, but it does require planning commission chair's signature as well as the select board chair's signature to go forward. That's right. Um, do we need another motion on that or did our motion last time make it approved upon a re, uh, these documents coming in and being acceptable? I think the previous motion was contingent upon receiving um, the approval of the neighbors for the project. So I don't believe a new motion would be uh, needed, but I, I'd have to go back to look at the minutes because I believe the motion was for me to sign um, as opposed to the chair of the PC and the chair of the select board. Okay, so uh, we'll entertain a new motion. I think that's the question first, Trini. Yep. Um, we, we have um, a, an agreement from one abutter. Um, we haven't heard from any other abutters. If, if, a, if one of the other neighbors or any neighbors, even if they're not abutters, um, were to object to this project, what would be their recourse if the select board goes forward right now? There is no other abutter, Larry. The same family that's putting this in owns all the rest of the land on all the other sides of this. Um, also, I just wanted to add, uh, and thank you for your time. Um, this is the beginning of the permitting process and 
and all uh, abutters have legal standing in the state permitting of the array and receive all the, the notices and, and uh, have legal standing and can come up and can comment. And the Gilderdales retain that standing going forward. So at what point in the process would, would they be able to do so, that? So the process from here on out um, entails something called a 45 day notice where a permitting package uh, gets served to um, everyone that has legal standing in the process, including the abutters. And that 45 day notice includes some preliminary site planning and a description of the project. Um, and then um, the, the permitting process, that so-called uh, CPG, Certificate of Public Good, uh, all of those parties retain standing all the way through final issuance. Um, and in fact, um, through the, uh, the open period of the permit. So, um, uh, you know, even after the permit is issued, um, if there are any issues with the installation of the array, the abutters have uh, legal standing and um, can make filings with the state through the Public Utilities Commission. Pat, are you saying something? You're muted. I wondered what their um, standing is in relation to landscaping and so forth, or or what? Uh, um, sorry, the, uh, Pat, the standing of the abutter. If I may, I may answer that. I, I've taken a number of trips to the. Uh, place for the solar array, uh, the original plan and the revised plan. But if you stand in the middle of that property and, uh, and look all around east, west, south, and north, uh, you don't see another uh, property, okay? You saw one property in the old plan, and that was the Gilderdales, okay? With the new plan, uh, they've agreed to that moving out of their, basically out of their view. So uh, I don't know what other abutters uh, would have a complaint about, but uh, there's, there's always that possibility that they could complain. I think basically what we're doing right now, the select board and the planning commission is is signing that letter saying this is a preferred site. Uh, That's but, exactly. uh, the, the process doesn't end there, yeah. But I asked what, once it goes beyond that level, an abutter could disagree with what? in terms of what, landscaping or color of the paint or what? They can complain about anything, Pat. But they where do they really have standing? They're really not gonna have a whole lot of the standing. The 205 process. It's, right, exactly. Uh, they can complain about everything, right? They don't like solar. They, you know, airplanes might have a glare flying over. We've proved that's not right. and then another one but um the main one is aesthetics and the folks that actually look out their window and see it they're the ones that have the most standing if you will well my concern is the same thing it was before that the town doesn't really have a process to deal with this nor any guidelines It does seem like a problem. If if we're if we're going to be deciding whether sites are preferred or not, do we do we how do we do so in a way which doesn't seem capricious? Spend an awful lot of time in planning commission meetings talking about it. That's the only way it's going to get resolved. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, Perry, um, I believe it was at one of the planning commission meetings early on. I believe it was uh, Attorney Brooke Dingledean that had mentioned that the subcommittee that was charged with reviewing the, the environmental portion of it or the energy portion of the, of the town plan, they chose to not take any action because the, the state is really driving the issue and the towns would have, even if we had something included in our town plan, 
it wouldn't carry the weight that the subcommittee wanted it to carry. So they specifically chose to not take any action. Um, but but to, to Sonny and Perry's point, the option was made available to the members of the community that had an interest in creating an energy portion of the plan. They just chose not to continue with it because they they came to the realization that the town really still had to comply with the state process. But this is an exception. This is an exception to the preferred sites. So, shouldn't we have some guidelines that we either grant the exception or not? I mean, we grant it because it doesn't affect any of the neighbors. It's well situated or whatever. But if you don't have any guidelines, then you basically have to approve anything. You so long as they, so long as they meet with the with the requirements in the in the land use regulations I, may, I might have used the wrong term when i said preferred site uh when the planning commission looked at it uh we weighed it against what was uh, stated in the town plan and uh, nothing in the town plan uh you know could prevent this from going forward so would, would there would there be an example of of a, of a site where the select board could say, no, we're not going to let that go forward and have a, a defensible rationale. Didn't we do that in Randolph Center? The 100 acre one? Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that I, I believe was was realized by the segment of the town community that wanted to have preferred sites identified and established was um, they brought in a guest speaker to speak during a planning commission meeting. I believe it was a planning commission meeting. Yeah. And the speaker specifically said that she was concerned that towns were setting preferred sites in forested areas and that that was something that she didn't agree with and was very concerned with that what I don't believe she addressed or even acknowledged was something I realized during the meeting but chose to not speak about was that areas typically owned by towns are wooded areas. And that's why towns throughout Vermont had, had established preferred sites in wooded areas because that's, that's the only land that they really owned. And they were essentially identifying areas within their town where they felt it would be best to have these solar arrays, even if it was on, on wooded land. So it would be very difficult to have a preferred site process in Randolph uh, if we only specifically focused on public land because much of the public land that the town owns is wooded area. <laughs> And we could set private property as preferred sites, but you know it would be very difficult for the town to enforce that, essentially telling companies you have to build solar arrays on private property. Um, so those are just some of the challenges that I feel exist and that some of the, the, the subcommittee members realized as they were trying to take this on. If, if we look at the letter that the uh, Norwich is asking us to sign, uh, the, the very last sentence in that letter says, uh, this letter is solely for the purpose of providing support for the project under section S-103. So basically they're asking for the support of the planning commission and the uh, town of Randolph select board, even though it says up in the, uh, the subject preferred siting designation under rule S-100. Uh, we purposely uh, did not put in the town plan areas for preferred siting for the some of the uh, uh, concerns that Adolfo just raised. Uh, but uh, in this case, you know, they use that term, but we're basically saying we, we support where you want to locate it. In other words, there's nothing against it. I don't think my question has been answered yet. Can you repeat not, your question, Larry? Not easy to answer. Yeah, about sure. about establishing 
preferred sites? Well, no, I, the question was if, if, if someone comes up with a site and the select board says no, without having some sort of process that we're relying on, is that, can, can we just do that, you know, and have it be defensible? Exactly. Well, the point was when we went through this and it's been, you know, this, this dragged on for probably close to two and a half to three years. And, you know, this all started with the state coming down here with a map showing us what were his preferred sites, challenging us with coming up with enough solar, which in our case, we needed 180 acres of solar in order to meet the renewable energy goals by 2050. So <clears throat> when you started talking about needing 180 acres, you started scaring people. And then, you know, we went to the other extreme where, you know, people were coming in demanding that you couldn't see it from somebody else's view shed five miles away across the East Valley or wherever. <clears throat> so that's where this whole subcommittee came from. And in the end, you know, the results of the subcommittee conversation was that, you know, through Annette Smith's conversation, that you know what we had in place was probably the best we could get, and she wasn't you know she was recommending that to the subcommittee that we, you know, we not alter this too much because it was going to open up a bigger can of worms. Yeah, so I, I we could start that. the process over again. You know, I you know. No, I I understand that. I understand exactly what you're saying, but by I'm just saying that that doesn't answer my question. Just, yeah, I get just what you're saying. And, and so, you know, in order to make it, I don't know what you make it defensible, somebody could probably turn around if you denied a permit, you know, or de de denied this portion of it, you, you, maybe you could be sued for it. I don't know. It's, uh, you know, this is all uncharted territory. And it's probably going to take a court case but, to figure it out. Well, I guess it just points to what Pat was saying is, you know, if, if we had at least something in policy that would give us some guidelines in terms of what we approve and what we don't, then we, we might have something. Two, we tried but, for two and a half years to come up with policy, Larry. So you're saying and that there's, there's, no, there's just, there's, just not, there's no way to, to do it. You couldn't make everybody happy. It was an ongoing conversation month after month after month. And that's why we set up the subcommittee was the subcommittee wanted to take on that challenge. And they came back months later and said, I guess we're good with what we've got. One, one thing I looked at uh, as far as view of the solar array, uh, nowhere on Route 14 can you see that solar array the way it's going to be positioned. It, it's actually hidden from view. And that was one of the criteria that we talked about was making sure yes. they weren't in public view. Right. Yeah, my, my feeling is this may be actually a good site, but we don't have a process to actually deal with it. That's my concern. We do have stuff in the ordinances, Perry, I think, that talks about landfill sites and so forth, our preferred sites. Right? Yeah, they are. But there was no guidance going any further than that. Right. So we put in a catch-all clause that basically will allow anything unless we have some sort of guideline. Well, the guidelines were there, you know, 10 acres, okay, not, you know, not viewable from, you know, other places around town or the roads or whatever. There was, there was a lot of that discussion. And yeah, another, and it, another, it, yeah, it another condition that we looked at was uh, that the state, the state strongly encourages that any power from solar arrays uh, stays in Vermont. And that was to get away from, uh, you know, the huge developers coming into Vermont, you know, getting 100 to 200 acres, and that uh, that power goes outside of Vermont, because Vermont has a, a, a criteria that we have to have so much uh, solar power within the state. So that was another condition that we looked at. And this is not going outside of Vermont, all the power generated. That's a plus, definitely. Yep. So we're not going to answer the problem tonight about a potential criteria being more specific. We've heard the challenges the Planning Commission has had trying to get to something like that. 
the question before us tonight is, does the select board support this specific solar array project? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, exactly. If, if I could, the select board actually had a motion and voted on it last time. This is just about, that, that's already been answered. Yeah, it was a motion. Except the wrong it's person in charge of signing. If you would have accepted our town manager to sign, we would be done this. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Uh, and I know for us to this particular project, I just, as things come up, I'd like to just know where, how we're going to ha handle projects which might be more controversial and, and what we're going to do then. But, but, but it, you know, it's similar to, you know, Act 250. Uh, you know, you, you have to jump through a heck of a lot of hoops in, in Act 250. So no matter what project you're going to approve or support, uh, you, you'll always, you know, end up with complainers. Uh, so I don't know. Um, I, th I think it's a good project and uh, I, I would support it fully. I would also point out that it's consistent with the resolution we passed in the wake of a uh, town meeting at my very first meeting as a member of this select board, putting the town on record as being committed to meeting the state um, and our own in our own town plan, uh, our own our own goals here in Randolph for um, Meeting, meeting our energy generation from renewable resources by 2035 and 2050. Um, so I really am convinced that all the work that the Planning Commission has done working with, with Norwich on this um, is in keeping with the goals we've established for our community in the past. And I think we should move forward with this. Let's cross the bridge of future projects when they come before us. This is a very much an evolutionary process that we're involved in right now. And I, I don't think we should, um, I don't think we should hold back on this project because of that. Is that a motion? Uh, you made, you made the last one. <laughs> <laughs> What should the, just to get clarity, what exactly should the motion? Um... I, if I could uh, make the suggestion, I believe it would be to the board to set the, the property that is designated for the solar array as a preferred site and then authorize um, that the town send a letter to the Plan and Utility Commission saying so. Uh, and then the signature on the letter would be uh, the Planning Commission Chair and the Select Board Chair. I will make that motion um, consistent with what Adolfo just recommended. I'll second it. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. That was an opposed, Pat? That was an opposed, yes. Okay, abstentions? Motion carries. Next up on the agenda is committee assignments. We have um, unfortunately one current vacancy within the Fire Operations Review Committee. We had one member from the Randolph Center Fire Department that uh, had to step away from the committee for personal reasons. Uh, and the Randolph Center Fire Chief has asked uh, that that person be replaced with another member of the, of the Center Fire Department who's named Alan Williams. Um, so we'd like to ask the select board to vote to appoint Alan Williams to the Fire Operations Review Committee. I'll so move. Second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. 
Thank you. The second item under appointments is for the East Valley Community Group. We've had three uh, members. Uh, we've had a, a request from the chair of the East Valley Community Group to appoint three members to the committee. Um, I believe this will require the select board to amend the total number of members of the East Valley Community Group uh, because I believe there currently are seven members and they have a full roster at seven and the request is to add three additional members bringing the total to 10. I'll move it that we extend this, the size of the committee to 10 and approve the additional members. I'll second it. Could we hear who the members are? Uh, yes, I, uh, I, I'm i sorry, at the start of the meeting, I did share uh, the with the names, uh, but it wasn't sent in advance, so my, my apologies for that. Okay. The names are Joan uh, Fierbend, the second name is Bobby Circum, and the third uh, is Kimberly Circum. Any comments, questions? I don't know those people, but if the group thinks that, that that's going to be helpful, I'm supportive of it. I agree. Yep, I just wanted a name. That's all. <laughs> Our three names. I believe they're all they're all current. They were all members of the East Valley Community Group before it became a town committee. Um, and the issue has been that when it comes down to vote for voting, these three longtime members can no longer vote. And so that that's potentially creating issues within the group. Mm -hmm. Call a question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Deaned. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, other business? Uh, no other business for me. Manager's report. Uh, I have four items. There. Uh, I'll run through them very quickly. One is um, we received a request from the uh, National Chimney Association um, requesting that the board at some point consider selling the chimney or the smokestack at the Branchwood property to them um, or donating. Um, I, a member of that group drove through Randolph for some reason and they saw the chimney and are interested in relocating it to their place in Ohio. I haven't confirmed whether or not it's, it's, wow. a, it's a joke or not. I just... <laughs> Received a letter, thought I'd share it with the board before Sounds I. Sounds like a joke. Place. Yeah. <laughs> Do they have a chimney museum or something? Uh, I have, I, I, because of <laughs> the letter and the request, I haven't had the time oh. to Google the group. <laughs> just, but, uh, oh, man. But I'll look into it and provide more information to the board as, as I find it. Um, It'd be worth a couple hundred thousand bucks, I think. <laughs> yeah. Easy. Yeah, I, can't see that we want to yeah. give that away you know it's that's serious money there you know <laughs> we want to hold out for the highest uh, I, want to hold, I think we should hold out for the highest bidder on the chimney yeah absolutely <laughs> okay no question <laughs> the uh, other i uh, two <laughs> three, two items um one is i received an email message from a resident on pearl street she is interested in potentially starting a garden on pearl street uh on a location along the, the branchwood property uh, they were not specific with what location, but um, they've heard a lot about what Roz has done and they're interested in doing something similar to that. So um, I did share with them that there could be, a, 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 you know, housing in the area and that we weren't, I couldn't authorize the creation of a garden, but that I would share the, her request with the select board and that I agreed to continue working with her to see what her plans are. And then I would report back to the select board uh the is that a community garden uh 
that is something that they would they, they, they weren't very specific. They just said that they, they like what Roz is doing and wanted to do something similar, but that was very specific. Yeah, very specific. Uh, the third point is that the Randolph Conservation Commission is working to establish a parking area for the forest in the northeast part of the town, the, uh, the rabbit track. Um, I'm working with them um, to establish essentially asking them to answer some very specific questions about where the parking would be, how would the neighbors would take it, whether the parking would be large enough for large trucks or just small cars. Um, so working on some specific details before I can bring more information back to the select board. Uh, and the third item is um, several months ago, I had um, asked VTrans if they had any interest in potentially having pilot projects of introducing recyclable material in the repaving process, essentially trying to make use of bottles that we could grind up and use instead of oil, use more recycled bottles. Um, conversation kind of stopped at that point because there was very little research about it. Uh, I received notice from local roads, which is uh, part of the state process, if I understand it correctly. They shared with me that a project in California is doing this now as a pilot project. So I reached out to the folks in California, asked them for more details. I spoke with the company that's going to be doing the paving. They confirmed that their material can be used or has been proven, has received positive results in negative 60 degree temperatures. So I'm starting the conversation again with Caltrans I've asked VTrans to join me in these conversations to see if we could potentially do something in the state, not necessarily in Randolph, but do something more with the recycled based material if it's proven to, to last in winter weather. So um, I'll have more information and I could share that with the board as we collect it. Uh, otherwise, that's, that's what I have for the manager's report. Okay, Adolfo, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um, we in a previous meeting we've talked about the um, following up to the resolution on racism possible subcommittee are, are, are we moving in any any direction on that now uh I, I if I remember correctly I think the the board had decided to potentially create a committee uh, and then have the, the person who would chair that committee lead you know work with me to see what we can do about changes or policies or reviewing policies or working with the sheriff's department so i i've i've been in a holding pattern to see what comes next um if a committee is going to be formed or not or i thought trini that you were going to have that on the agenda tonight from what you told uh, me well it was uh tom actually was writing a document that he was going to circulate to everybody. Uh, I believe it was last week, last weekend, Tom. Yeah, and he wanted I, on the agenda, and the document never surfaced. Right. So. Um. I guess I would like some some guidance from. Um, others on the select board as to exactly what they envision that committee being and what its role um, would be before I draft anything because I I don't have a sense uh, th that we have consensus on what that committee might look like moving forward and what exactly um, we would do institutionally to address issues of racism in the community. It's it's just it feels very vague to me right now. I thought uh, that was the whole point of the subcommittee was to figure that out. Yeah. Whether it's educational or um, whatever, I thought the committee was going to take that in hand and figure out what things would be reasonable that we could do, and, you know, maybe what we can't do. Well, Pat, do you want to help somebody write what this committee is, what the charge is, what the That's what I'm getting at. I don't really feel like we understand quite. Yeah, 
you want to work on that together, Tom? Sure. Let me, can... let me come up with something and then I'll email it to you, okay? Sounds good, and we can discuss it at the next uh, at next month's meeting. Okay. Sounds fine to me. Yeah. Thank you both. Is that the end of the manager's report, Adolfo? Yes, that's it. That's the end of it. Okay. Uh, next is um, executive session. And this is for a real estate transaction as well as a employee issue. Okay, Can I'm I ask, going to executive session. Can I ask a question when you after the motion is seconded? You want me to ask the question now? No, we got to have a second to. Okay. I'll, I'll second. Here we go. My question is, if we're talking about the town clerk and the treasurer in general, that's not executive session. If we're talking about our town clerk and treasurer as a person, that's executive session material. But if we're talking about whether we want to appoint, we'd like to go to an appointment system or whether we'd like to keep it the way it is, that's not executive session material in my mind. That's something the public has a right to know what we think on that. And it's not about individuals, it's about the position. I, Pat, I, I don't disagree with you. I think the, the challenge is the way the request ha was made. It wasn't, it wasn't made clear if it was a conversation about the retirement, potential retirement of a person or about the position itself. Um, so without that clarity, the only thing that I could have done from the HR perspective was to ensure that the confidentiality portion is there, that the position that currently, the person that currently holds a position is protected. Um, so if it was something that was less, less person specific and more position specific, then that would be something that in order for me to add to the agenda, to even request to be added to the agenda, I think would have to be a very specific, this is what we want to talk about, as opposed to a general request, we want to talk about the treasurer clerk well, or the town manager. Given that, given that we have not received a formal um, uh, resignation or retirement notice yet, why are we even having this discussion at this stage until such time as it really needs to be addressed formally. I don't, I don't get it. If the town wants to move from an elected position of the town clerk, town treasurer right. to hired position, we need to vote in November. Okay. Otherwise we will have no time for which we can double fill for training. So Trini, do we have time to do we have time to discuss this at our next regular meeting? Uh, so that will I don't know, Larry, because uh, your ballots have to be prepared and advanced and warned. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what that timeline is. But okay. the HR issue is a different issue than this. This yeah. was of them that we wanted to talk about, but we have another HR issue. Um, okay. So uh, that part is still relevant, but we we do need to decide how we want to handle town clerk, town clerk, and if we want to put it out to vote, because I got to believe if it's going to vote, it's got to get put on a ballot because early ballots go out when in December, pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. For for some reason, the the, the forty five 40, days. I forty five days stands out in my head about yeah having to make a, a decision. I believe that's correct. So, if we want to do that, maybe we need to call a special meeting very soon, and just for that that topic. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And to, to, to Pat's, to Pat's <laughs> point, I, I think at this point, the, the select board would not be able to talk about the position itself because it's not on the agenda and the right. agenda's already been approved. Um, you know, it, 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 you know oh. sorry, Pat, I think yeah. if we had known early on, we, we could have made a different, the board could have made a different decision. I thought you added to it, not to the agenda. We did, but it was under the executive session with my understanding that the board wanted to speak about the potential alleged retirement or comment, the HR portion, as opposed to the position itself, not the person, but the position. So we have to hold a hearing for the grant application before September 3rd. We can put both of these on the same agenda. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to go into executive session for real estate and personnel. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Uh, just to clarify, um, we uh, we want Adolfo on the real estate one, but not on the HR one. So if I if I may ask the board, um, it, once I do exit the meeting, I could exit the meeting and Zoom will continue. Um, if I could just ask the secretary of the board to just keep track and to exit executive session and the motion the motion to end the meeting. Uh, unless someone on the board wants to text me and then I could rejoin the meeting afterward. But um, if, if someone just kept track of that information, Shannon and I can then add it to the minutes. We can do that. Thank you. Let's see, who's our secretary? Perry. Okay, okay. good night, everyone. So I'm texting Adelpha. Okay. Thanks, night. Shannon. Um, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Okay, let me Shannon. Phone here. Shannon, before you go, are you still? I am still here. Yep. I'd like to thank you for your service. Sorry to see you go. Thank you. But good luck. Thank also, you. I totally agree with that. It's been yeah. wonderful having you, Shannon. Thank you. Thank you, you so much, Shannon. Thank you. Me I've... too, Shannon. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you just yeah. want to. I'll point out that Shannon's on vacation this week, so she agreed to sign in while on vacation. So dedicated, right? <laughs> well, I have also learned a lot and enjoyed working for the town. So thank you. Not it wasn't an easy decision to make. <laughs> if you ever want to come back, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. I am going to at this point. Uh, I know we have Orca Media on the on the call, so I'm going to remove them from the meeting since we're entering executive session.